the Senate Health and Human Services Committee to order. I'd like to get started. Uh, we have a lot of material to walk through today, and I appreciate all of the um, all of you coming. Um, we will be going through the bill. Um, our fiscal analyst, um, Dennis Albrecht, is going to be walking through the spreadsheet. Um, then we will move to testimony, and we have some departments and boards, and then uh, we have public testimony, uh, people who have signed up and are either going to be testifying by way of Zoom or um, in person. So uh, we have a lot to go through, and I appreciate your attention. Um, we will be um, the public testimony, we're, we're allocating two minutes per person so that we don't, um, we have, I don't know, over close to 50 people that wanted us to talk. So um, we'd like to keep each testifier to two minutes, please. So we'll begin, um, first we'll begin with a walkthrough of the spreadsheet. I'll turn it over to our fiscal analyst. <coughs> Mr. Albrecht, please go ahead and begin when you're ready. Um, we have now, um, he will be going through the document that is a single spreadsheet for both uh, children and families and health and human services. Good and afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members. I want to just begin by saying it's really fun to be back in this room. When I first started working for the Senate, this was the room um, that my committee met in. It was not this committee, but I really like this room, and it's kind of fun. Um, Madam Chair and members, the spreadsheet we have um, has a today's date and at the bottom a timestamp of 1.46 p.m. Um, just to orient you uh, to how it is constructed, um, the left-hand column eventually will uh, include a uh, the names attached to all of the proposals or, and uh, some cross-references to agency documents or uh, Senate bill numbers. <clears throat> uh, the middle set of columns there with the title governor on them is the governor's revised budget. And then on the right-hand side, those seven columns are uh, reflecting what is in the delete everything for Senate file 2995. Um, you may have heard that this committee has two targets, which is true. Um, but in the Senate, we have one committee, um, one spreadsheet, and one target. That amount is on line four. <clears throat> and it, the first one you see there, the number where it says target, um, is there separately because that number is a three-year number and includes the amounts for fiscal year 2023 and the total for the biennium of fiscal year 2024 and 2025 for a total of $1,008,400,000. And then the tails target is on line six of $789.5 million. The all funds totals are the top line on line five, if that interests you. And the non-general fund items are on lines 7 to 13. Um, lines 18 to 27 track the balance in the healthcare access fund. The global agreement required there to be a balance at the end of fiscal year 2027 of $276 million. And that is what the last amount there that you see represents. Lines 35 to 41 um, track <coughs> the uh, changes to the medical assistance program by each eligibility category. And uh, beginning on line 44 on page 1 to mm -hmm. line 119 on page 2, are the total appropriations um, for each of the agencies that would receive um, an appropriation in the Senate file 2995. 
on page uh, two, beginning on line uh, 123, this is uh, where we move into the uh, agency proposals. Um, I will do my best to uh, keep you oriented to a line and describe the right amounts for the right funds. Uh, the first proposal is a governor's proposal. This is the child care assistance program rate update. Um, the Senate's position is the entire governor's position of $146.9 million in the first biennium and $276 million in the second. On line uh, 135, Hold on just a second. Uh, this is a provision that was in Senate File 49. It is um, also a governor's proposal of uh, establishing MA eligibility for 72 months for children. Um, the Senate's position is the governor's of $21.3 million in the first biennium and 95.5 in the second. On line 145, is the governor's general assistance uh, program uh, benefit increase um, along with some uh, program changes. And the total for that is $21.7 million in the first biennium and $61.1 million in the second. Um, the way this spreadsheet is constructed is it includes everything in the governor's budget. If like on line 153, there are all zeros uh, in a proposal, that means the Senate uh, does not pick up that proposal, and from now on, I will just skip those. On line 164 is additional funding for the emergency services program. This is a governor's proposal, and in Senate File 388, Senator Dibble's bill, uh, the Senate's amounts are $8.7 million in the first biennium and in the second. On uh, line 164, 70 is also uh, from Senator Dibble, Senate File 388. This is funding for the transitional housing program, and the Senate's position is $5.4 million each biennium. Moving on to page four, on line 176 is additional funding for the Homeless Youth Act. This is Senator Dibble's bill of uh, $5.2 million per year ongoing plus administrative expenses, totaling $10.7 million in each biennium. On line 182 is, this is from Senate File 388, uh, chosen family grants, a $2 million one-time appropriation in fiscal year 2024. On line 188 is additional funding. Uh, this is also from Senator Dibble, uh, different bill number. Um, ongoing funding for the Safe Har Harbor Shelter and Housing uh, Activities at the Department of Human Services of $1 million per year ongoing. The next proposal is one of the department's uh, information technology proposal. This one is um, service delivery transformation and the Senate's position is $16 million in the first biennium and 11.6 in the second. <coughs> On line 208 is um, a governor's proposal relating to the basic siting fee program to, uh, to permanently reprioritize the order of eligibility within that program. This is entirely funded with uh, the Federal Child Care Development Block Grant. The total is $7.8 million um, in the first biennium and 17.4 in the second. Uh, at the top of page five <coughs> is a uh, governor's proposal of additional funding for the basic sliding fee program. This, uh, the Senate picks up $20 million each biennium. On line 216 is uh, the governor's proposal for child care assistance program provider retention pay payments. This is a re uh, new program um, to pick up where the current program um, ends. Uh, and the Senate's position on that is $245.9 million in the first biennium and $291.3 million in uh, the second. 
Line 222 is a governor's proposal for child care stabilization transition grants. So this is between the new program on line 216 and the existing program during which there is uh, anticipated to be a three-month gap. And this $41.9 million would be grants to providers during that time. Line 228 is um, the governor's child care workforce development and scholarships. That is about $2 million the first biennium and four in the second. Um, line 235 is the Governor's Child Care Provider Support Grant Program of $7.3 million in the first biennium and 10.4 in the second. Line 244 is also the Governor's um, Child Care Assistance Program, Industry and Workforce. This is administrative money to implement all of those things above it. Um, $8.9 million in the first biennium and $8.1 million in the second. Um, line 252 on page six is the governor's proposal for the MFIP program. Uh, to provide six-month eligibility and to use a current income or a more current income for benefit determinations for MFIP and the General Assistance Program. The note there underneath it talks about uh, the fact that during the budget period of uh, and the planning period of 24 to 27, this proposal uses money from the TANF fund and at the end of or beginning in fiscal year 2028, the entire cost of the program would be in the general fund. Um, you can see how the proposal is distributed between the two funds on lines 254 and 255. Um, the overall cost of the proposal is of the proposal is 3.9 million dollars in the first biennium, with 2.3 of that coming out of the general fund, and 75.5 million in the uh, in the second biennium, with 34. Uh, almost $35 million coming out of the general fund. So that amount, that $22.5 million per year that's shown on the TANF fund would, beginning in fiscal year 2028, come out of the general fund. Line 269 is the Governor's Family First Prevention Services Act uh, funding. The Senate accepts the entire governor's position of $33.9 million in the first biennium and $47.6 million in the second. Line 281 is um, the governor's um, planning and implementation money for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and to join the American Indian Child Welfare Initiative. That is $8.8 .8 million in 24-25 and 15.9 in 26-27. The next proposal is on page seven on line 299. This is uh, funding for food security for tribal nations and American Indian communities. The Senate picks up $2 million per year ongoing, um, including some administrative funding. The next proposal is on line 305. <coughs> um, this is additional money for uh, Minnesota Food Shelf Program of $3 million per year ongoing, including some administrative funding. The next proposal after that is on page eight in the middle on line 343. Um, this is a governor's proposal to uh, give grants to the counties to, um, to help them reduce their uh, uh, child protection caseloads. Um, it's three, I'm sorry, $6.3 million, $6 million in the first biennium and in the second. It's the only proposal on that page. The next proposal is on page nine at the top. <clears throat> on line 366 is um, an uh, SSIS update for a new non-caregiver sex trafficking response path, which is a uh, appropriation of $100,000 in the first biennium and ongoing of $17,000 per year. On line 370 is additional funding for a contracted employment and income verification service of $1 million per year ongoing. On line 374 um, 
is modifications to the child care program to include foster care and relative to include eligibility for foster care and relative caregivers. This is a governor's proposal it, uh, with $11.8 million total in the first biennium and 58.3 in the second. On line 382, um, if anyone's getting bored and wondering where is the Senate stuff in there, it's all at the end. Um, line 382 um, is additional funding for the Family Assets for Independence in Minnesota program. The Senate um, picks up $4.2 million in the first biennium and 5.4 in the second. Um, line 388 is uh, a governor's proposal for MA eligibility modifications for former foster care youth from other states. This is a federal compliance issue um, with a cost of $1.9 million in the first biennium and $1.1 .1 in the second. On uh, line 395 are um, the governor's proposed uh, changes for the child support enforcement program and, and some federal compliance. Perhaps it's all federal compliance. Um, that is $486,000 in the first biennium and two hundred twenty in the second. The very bottom of that page on line 403 are changes to uh, provider registration for child care providers um, with cost of $480,000 in the first biennium and $1.2 million in the second. On la uh, page 10 on line 408, um, is the governor's proposal relating to background study requirements for legal non-licensed child care providers. Um, that is $290,000 in the first biennium and $58,000 in the second. On line 413 is the governor's um, centralized provider registration um, system for child care providers of $330,000 in the first biennium and 110 in the second. Um, on line 417 is a, the second of the governor's um, information technology proposals. This one is for integrated services for children and families. And the Senate picks up uh, $14.1 million in the first biennium and about $8 million in the second. I believe it's true on all of these information technology proposals that the Senate took about 54% of the governor's proposed amounts. Um, on this proposal, actually, on line 439 is uh, the language from Senate File 2141 um, relating to child protection paperwork reduction. Um, so the Senate is, is incorporating those requirements into the funding amount for this proposal. On uh, next page, on page 11, um, on line 460 is additional funding for Indian child welfare grants. Um, this is the full amount of the governor's proposal, $8.8 .8 million in the first biennium and 9.3 in the second. On line 476 is a governor's proposal to... Uh, Increase rates for adult day treatment services. Uh, the cost for that is 943,000 in the first biennium and 1.4 million in the second. On the next page, we're on page 12 now in the middle. On line 502 is additional funding, or I'm sorry, new funding uh, to develop an emerging moon, mood disorders grant program. This is a fully funded governor's proposal of $2.7 million in the first biennium and in the second. Um, on line 508 is a, a new program for mobile response and stabilization services grant program. This is a governor's proposal for $2.3 million in the first biennium and 2.2 in the second. On line 515 is um, a governor's proposal to expand access to first episode psychosis teams. Um, with uh, $1.35 million per year ongoing. 
On line 519 is additional operations staff for grants administration at the Department of Human Services of $194,000, the first by name, and two hundred and eight dollars in the second. On the next page, page 13, on line 524, is a governor's proposal um, for additional funding for mobile crisis grants of um, $12.5 million in the first biennium and 16.6 in the second. On line 531 is a governor's proposal to establish funding. Um, um, so this is a new program for mobile crisis, I'm sorry, tribal mobile crisis response teams of $1 million per year ongoing. Line 535 is additional funding for infant and early childhood mental health consultation. Um, it's a million dollars per year ongoing with some administrative funding. On line 547 is the governor's proposal to establish a rate, a floor, I'm not a rate floor, just a floor <laughs> for county and tribal behavioral health fund administrative assess assessments. The hash marks um, on a human services spreadsheet indicate uh, whether or not the proposal is included. Um, so it was a governor's recommendation and the Senate is picking it up is what those uh, marks there are uh, intended to convey. On line 549 is a governor's proposal for research to develop a recommendation for new behavioral health fund county and tribal administrative allocations. It's a one-time cost of $170,000. On the next page, on page 14, on line 579 is additional funding for um, for cultural and ethnic minority infrastructure grants um, of $1.5 million uh, per year. Uh, this was also a Senate bill and I neglected to um, put the bill number on there. Um, on line 592 is um, funding for new um, Psychiatric Residential Treatment Facility Startup Grants. This is the governor's proposal of $2.2 million in the first and the second biennium. Uh, on the next page, page 15, at the top on line 599 is the governor's um, specialization grants for um, psychiatric... Uh, Psychiatric Residential Treatment Facilities. This is $2.3 million in both biennia. Uh, on line 606 are the governor's proposed uh, modifications to housing stabilization services. Um, that is $7.4 million in the first biennium and 13.7 in the second. On line 622 <clears throat> is um, Funding for the governor's proposal for the homeless management information system, that is um, $850,000 in the first biennium and $1.5 million in the second. The next proposal is at the bottom of that page on line 636. This is uh, the governor's modifications to um, MSA is a Minnesota Supplemental Assistance Program. There's a requirement in there relating to re representative payee, special needs payment. Um, the governor has some proposed changes to how that is uh, dealt with in the benefit determination. $720,000 in the first um, biennium and $1.1 million in the second. On line 540 are the governor's changes to um, the housing support program relating to uh, how income is counted. The cost for that proposal is $4.8 million in the first biennium and 13.3 in the second. Um, line 548 is also related to countable income. This one is uh, to eliminate tribal per capita payments from eligibility determination in those programs listed there, the General Assistance Program, the Minnesota Supplemental Assistance Program, Housing Support, MFIP, and Child Care. The cost for that is $271,000 in the first biennium and three eighty-two dollars in the second. The next proposal is on line 659. This is the governor's proposed presumptive eligibility for housing support. The 
the total cost for that is $2.4 million in the first biennium and $3.5 million in the second. The next proposal is on line 664. <clears throat> this is um, a por the Senate is picking up a portion of the governor's proposal to improve uh, applicant and enrollee experience for MA in Minnesota care. The Senate's total for that is $8 million in the first biennium and 3.8 in the second. On line 871 is the governor's proposal to establish uh, Minnesota care eligibility for children who are undocumented. Uh, this is from the Health Care Access Fund, and the total for that is $1 million in the uh, first biennium and $22.1 million in the second. On line 675 is the governor's proposal for the Minnesota care buy-in. That's $17.4 million in the first biennium and 11.4 in the second. On the next page, page 17, on line 683, are the governor's proposed modifications to the uh, MA payment methodology for tribal FQHCs. This is 13, I'm sorry, $1.3 million in uh, the first biennium and 1.4 in the second. Um, line 690 <clears throat> is another of the governor's um, information technology proposals. And the Senate picks up $9.7 million in the first biennium and uh, $522,000 in the second. Uh, line 697 is, um, I believe, um, on its way to being enacted and sent to the governor. Um, but it is included in the target for this bill. And so it is showing <clears throat> on the spreadsheet here um, so that we can count it against the target. That's the end of that page. On the next page, on page 18, on line 720, is um, reinstating the adult benefit set in uh, MAN in Minnesota care. It also rebases dental rates. For um, you can see the the cost for the for MA is on line 721, and the cost for Minnesota care is on line 722. The total for both funds is $30 million in the first biennium and uh, 49.9 in the second. Uh, line 731 is the il governor's proposed elimination of the doula, doula supervision requirements. The cost for that is 73,000 in the first biennium and 80,000 in the second. Line 736 is the governor's proposal to eliminate cost sharing and medical assistance, and that carries a cost of $9.2 million in the first biennium and 13.4 in the second. Uh, on line <clears throat> 743 is a governor's proposal to reimburse providers for newborn screening in outpatient settings with a cost of $7,000 in the first biennium and $9,000 in the second. Line 747 is the governor's proposed modifications to behavior health licensing um, and affects those uh, settings uh, listed there. Uh, I am not going to go through all those acronyms. Uh, $2.8 million in the first biennium and 6.3 in the second. On line 759, um, are the governor's changes um, for, this is also, I believe, a Senator Klein bill, um, the drug, f or maybe it was Hoffman, uh, for the drug formulary committee modifications um, that has a savings of $59.5 million in the first biennium and $78.6 million in the second. Um, line 765 is a governor's proposal and also Senator Kunish's Senate File 2197. This is a grant to the Indian Health Board of Minneapolis. Um, it's $2.5 million a year for three years plus administrative money. On uh, line 771 <clears throat> is the DHS side of the governor's um, proposed changes to Merck financing and distribution requirements with a cost of $33.5 million in the first biennium and 36.6 in the second. 
On line 785 is the governor's uh, proposed modifications to withhold provision in provisions in um, the managed care contracts. On the next page, on page, <coughs> excuse me, page 20, this is a series of governor's um, proposals that um, relate to money but don't have a cost. Um, line 793 is modifications to hospital rate rebasing requirements um, to account for decreased utili utilization um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, line 7795 is um, the governor's proposal to implement a 24-month requirement uh, for certain providers to report information relating to supplemental payments. Um, line 797 is uh, changes to third-party liability requirements, um, which are federal uh, federally required changes. Um, Line 799 is a proposal to eliminate the authority to assess and recover enrollee error overpayments. On line 801 is a rate increase, a governor's proposal for a rate increase for reproductive health services in MA and Minnesota care with $517,000 in the first biennium and $800,000 or $799 in the second. On line 18, um, 810 is the governor's proposal to implement a rate, rate methodology for long-term acute care hospitals. That is, again, a proposal that relates to money but does not uh, have a cost. <coughs> On line 812 is, I believe, the fourth of the governor's information technology proposals. This one relates to MMIS um, and the Senate picks up $7.6 million one-time cost in fiscal year 2024. On line 816 is the governor's proposal to extend the authority for um, audio-only telehealth till June 30th, 2025, and that has a cost of $16.7 million in the first biennium and $1.4 million in the second. On line 824 is the governor's... Uh, um, uh, proposal for to maintain current service level. This is the central office portion for DHS of $45.7 million in the first biennium and 55.9 in the second. On line 844 on <clears throat> page 21, is uh, I believe this is the fifth of the governor's technology proposals, and this one relates to provider licensing. Um, the Senate picks up $8.8 .8 million in the first biennium and 4.9 in the second. Line 858 <coughs> is the governor's proposed uh, additional funding for background studies operations of $3 million in the first biennium and $4 million in the second. Line 863 is a background studies fee increase. Um, it has a general fund cost of $52,000 per year. Um, lines 867 and 868 uh, show you the amount of revenue that would result from the, re, uh, the fee increase per year and then um, how much the, the, that the revenue that the fee revenue is used to pay for administering the background studies program. The next page <clears throat> on page 22, which is halfway, um, <laughs> on line 870 is uh, a grant to establish a, uh, a tribal nation fraud prevention um, program. Um, with $608,000 in the first biennium and two twenty-four in the second. Line 876 um, is the governor's proposed modifications to the adult mental health, I'm sorry, the adult residential mental health rule. $348,000 in the first biennium and three fifty-six in the second. On line 
8.8.3 is a uh, governor's proposal to implement a continuous license process for family, family child care providers with a one-time cost of $708,000. Line 8.8.8 is um, uh, the governor's proposal for financial fraud and abuse investigations program integrity enhancements. That's $1.4 million in the first biennium and one point two in the second. Line 896 is administrative funding of $170,000 to create a new statutory chapter for public law background studies. Um, line 901 is um, a governor's proposal to make modifications to chapter 245C background study requirements. That carries a cost of 678 in the first biennium and 426 in the second. The next page on page 23 on line um, eight, I'm sorry, 910 is, um, I'm sorry, we didn't pick that one up. Um, line 914 is uh, the DHS portion of the, the governor's easy enrollment proposal, which is $737,000 in the first biennium and seven hundred eighty-eight in the second. Um, line 919 is a DHS cost related to a Ministry of Technology Modernization proposal. That's $3.2 million in the first, first biennium and, uh, and $2 million in the second. Lines 927 to 937 are um, related to the structure of the target and the structure of, of, um, of the proposals in the Senate um, related to the target. So the target has two components, actually three. One relates to children and families proposals. One relates to health and human services proposals. And one relates to um, to the healthcare access fund, and these lines deal with all of that. If you want more detail, I would be happy to spend some time, but I'm assuming the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, Madam Chair and members, continuing on page 24. On line 949 uh, is a governor's proposal relating to modifications to MFIP sa sanctions. Um, the, the cost for that is $4.2 million in the first biennium and $16.9 million in the second. On line 959 is the governor's uh, proposed um, cost of living adjustment for the MFIP housing benefit which is $2.4 million in the first biennium and uh, 4.6 in the second. I should indicate that those proposals do involve both the general fund and the TANF fund. I read you the, the total amounts for, um, for those proposals and you can see the distribution between the two funds um, below the title. That's the end of governor's proposals for a little while. Um, now is going to be a whole long list of Senate um, proposals, beginning on line 966 with Senator Abler's um, Senate file 2088. Um, that is the county training pilot uh, program for um, uh, economic assistance programs with one-time funding of $296,000. Uh, line 971 is Senator Mann's uh, Senate File 329 to eliminate co-payments for services after a mammogram. Um, that's $33,000 in the first biennium and $16,000 uh, in the second. <clears throat> line 976 is also a Senator Mann bill, Senate File 328. Um, that relates to prescription drug price transparency and disclosure requirements. $336,000 in the first biennium and one hundred twelve in the second. Line 980 is one of several proposals from Senator Wicklin's um, Senate File 1679. This one is Mental Health Provider Supervision Grant Program and it's $1.5 million per year ongoing. 
The next one from that bill <clears throat> is on the next page, page 25 at the top on line 986, and it is Mental Health Professional Scholarship Grant Program of $750,000 per year ongoing. Line 1747 is Senator Frentz's um, bill for um, the Center for Rural Behavioral Health at Mankato State that is um, a one-time uh, funding of $1.5 million with some administrative funding that continues uh, for one year into the next biennium. Total is $1.6 million in 24-25 and $26,000 uh, in the second biennium. Line 998 is Senate File 404, Senator Mann's bill for relating to the managed uh, care opt-out for medical assistance. That has a savings of $7 million in the first biennium and $24.8 million in the second. Line 1010 is Senate File 1260, Senator Hoffman's bill um, for additional funding for community action of $1.5 million per year ongoing. Line 1016 is Senate File 379, uh, another Senator Hoffman bill to exclude RSDI income uh, for eligibility determination for economic assistance programs. That's $3.4 million in the first biennium and 9.2 in the second. <clears throat> Line uh, 1023 at the bottom of that page is Senate File 2145, a Senator Hoffman bill. This is a study for DHS to, um, to look at um, incorporating a benefit, palli benefit for palliative care into MA in Minnesota care. It's a one-time cost of $102,000. On the next page, on page 26, at the top on line 1028 is Senate File 302. This is a Senator Mann bill relating to the all-payer claims database, um, that one on uh, the DHS side um, has $52,000 of costs and $56,000 in the second biennium. Uh, and that one will show up later when we talk about the Department of Health. Um, as well, the next one, Senate File 2002, Senator Wicklin's um, bill uh, relating to the Health Care Affordability Board. The DHS costs for that proposal are $156,000 in the first biennium and $160,000 the $8,000 in the second. Um, line 1038 is Senate File 926, Senator Bolden's bill for a rate increase for mental health services. Um, that proposal is $49 million in the first biennium and $80.2 million in the second biennium. Uh, the next one is Senate File 1951. This is Senator Morrison's bill. Uh, relating to MA coverage for recuperative care services, $2.3 million in the first biennium and $3.2 million in the second. <clears throat> Line 10, I'm sorry, yes, 1059 is Senate File 1590. Uh, this is Senator Champion's bill for a grant to the African American Child Wellness Institute of $1 million per year ongoing. Line 1063 is Senate File 1620, Senator Fate's bill for a grant to Headway Emotional Health Services. That's a one-time grant of $300,000 per year for two years. On the next page, page 27 at the top is Senator Paz, uh, 20, Senate File 2873. <clears throat> um, this is a grant uh, to the Special Guerrilla Units Veterans and Families of the USA, um, which is ongoing of $250,000 per year. Uh, Senate File 287 is uh, Senator Murphy's bill uh, for uh, MA coverage uh, for contraceptive supplies, $262,000 in the first biennium and eighty eight in the second. Line 1075 is Senate File 2693, Senator Wicklin's bill to rebase uh, hospital payment rates. Um, the cost for that is $17.9 million in the first biennium and $22.7 in the second. 
Line 1081 is Senate File 2923. This is Senator Morrison's bill um, to provide a rate increase for doula services. That's $329,000 in the first biennium and four eighty-six dollars in the second. Line 1086 is Senate File 1967, also a Senator Morrison bill um, for MA coverage for uh, Caesar detection devices. That is $67,000 in the first biennium and $80,000 in the second. Line 1092 is Senate File 2459, Senator Mann's bill for MA coverage for services provided by pharmacists. That is $2.7 million in the first biennium and 4.2 in the second. Line 1099 is Senate File 652. This is Senator Wicklund's bill relating to MFIP eligibility requirements and citizenship. Uh, $908,000 in the first biennium and $1.5 million in the second. The next proposal is on page 28 at the top on line 1106. It's Senate file 1903. This is Senator McEwen's bill um, for the Homeless Youth Cash Stipend Pilot Project that would end in 2028. Um, it is $3 million per year ongoing with some administrative funding for a total of $6.1 million in both biennia. Line 1112 is um, Senate File 2606. This is Senator Bolden's bill um, for the Early Childhood Registered Apprenticeship Grant Program. It's $4.5 million in both biennia. Line 1118 is Senate File 1638, Senator Kunish's bill for a grant to the Quality Parenting initi Initiative of $100,000 per year ongoing. Line 1122 is Senate File 2464. This is Senator Mitchell's bill relating to the um, misspelled Foster Children Benefits Trust. Um, Money there is sort of a placeholder acknowledging that uh, under some version of that proposal, the counties are likely to lose money. We don't know how much it is. Um, this is um, intended to address that issue um, further on into session. Um, the next proposal is on line 1126, Senate File 1680. This is Senator Wicklund's bill about family, friend, and neighbor child care grants. Um, it's $3.5 million in the first year and ongoing for a total of 6.9 in the tails. Um, line 1132 is Senate File 2053, Senator, <coughs> Senator Bolden's bill um, for a grant uh, to Olmstead County for people experiencing homelessness. It is $1.2 million per year ongoing, including administrative funding. <clears throat> Line 1138 is Senate File 2033, Senator Marty's bill for a grant to Ramsey County for <clears throat> the Heading Home Ramsey County Continuum of Care uh, Initiative. It's $6.8 million per year ongoing, including administrative funding. Uh, Madam Chair and members, on <clears throat> the next page, page 29, um, on line 1144, is Senate File 2813, um, a one-time grant to um, <clears throat> the Catholic Charities Homeless Elders Program of 750 per year for two years, including administrative funding. Line 1150 is Senate File 673, Senator May Quaid's uh, bill for Family Supportive Housing Program. It's uh, $8.2 million in both biennia. Line 1156 um, is Senate File 2647, Senator Kupek's bill um, for um, a grant program for prepared meals, food relief. It is uh, $1.25 million per year ongoing, including administrative funding. 
Line 1162 um, is Senate File 2599. That is Senator Bolden's bill for a diaper distribution grant program. It is uh, 500000 per year with some additional money for administration for a total of $1.1 million in both biennium. Line 1168 is Senator Muhammad, Senate File 456. This is a grant to Hennepin County for services to people experiencing homelessness. It's $5.4 million in the first biennium and 10 point, I'm sorry, 21.6 in the second. Uh, line 1174 is Senate File 2229, Senator Wicklund's bill um, that has a couple of components here. The first one is uh, the Child Care Early Education Professional Wage Scale. That's a one-time cost of $817,000. The next one is on line 1179. This is a cost estimation model for early care and learning programs of $68,000 one time. On the next page, on page 30 at the top, is the another of those Senator Wickland proposals. This one is a task force to look at um, developing um, comparable compensation uh, models or uh, information for early childhood workforce. It's a one-time cost of $208,000. And the last from that bill is uh, on line 1189, additional funding for retained grants of um, that add up to $2.5 million in the first biennium and 3.6 in the second. And on 11, line 1195 is Senate file 1852, Senator Fate's grant to uh, the Corner House and First Wellness, First Witness Children's Advocacy Center um, with a cost of $340,000 per year ongoing. Madam Chair, that's the end of proposals at the Department of Human Services. And the first one in the Department of Health is your bill, Madam Chair, Senate File 2588, um, which is also a governor's proposal for the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, this is a fee-based proposal. Um, you can see the amounts that um, come from the fee on lines 1214 and 1215, and uh, the general fund picks up sort of the cost of that proposal in the first year, and then it switches to ongoing funding from the fees. Um, the cost for that is 3.5, I'm sorry, $3.6 million in the first biennium and 2.6 of savings in the second. Um, that is because the fee revenue replaces the current general fund appropriations for that purpose, which are shown on line 1211. On the next page, on page 31, is, um, is the governor's proposal for advancing equity through capacity building and resource allocation. Um, it's two point, well, three point three million dollars in the first biennium and 2.9 in the second. Uh, the next one is on page 1242. This is an appropriation out of the state government special revenue fund for the MDH activities related to assisted living, licensure, and home care. This is not a fee increase. It is just an appropriation out of the fund from the money that is already there from the existing fee structure. It's $7.1 million in 2024-25 and in the second biennium as well. Uh, the next one is on line 1247. It is the same thing. It is additional funding for background studies, but it is not a fee increase. It is appropriating money that is already there of $2.88 million per year. On line 1251 is a governor's proposal to eliminate a chronic condition spending report that is paid for out of the health care access fund and would save $185,000 per year. On line 1255, is the governor's proposal for grants to promote local planning for climate resiliency, and that's $12.5 million in the first biennium and 3.2 in the second. 
Um, and the Senate did not pick up the entire amount for the governor's proposal on that one. <laughs> on line 1260 is the governor's proposal for a grant to the Minnesota Community Health Worker, Al Worker Alliance. It's $971,000 per year ongoing. On the next page, we're now on page 32. At the top is Senate File 402, Senator Kunish's bill and also a governor's proposal for funding for the Community Solutions Grant Program. The Senate picks up $8 million um, in the first biennium. I'm sorry, yes, $8 million in the first biennium and 8.1 in the second. The next proposal is on line 12. 86, in the middle of the page, the Department of Health Cultural Communications Program of $3.5 million in, the, um, well, how about $1.7 million ongoing? Uh, line 1290 is uh, a governor's proposal for the Department of Health relating to promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion within the department. It's 362000 in the first biennium and 674 in the second. Line 1294 is a governor's proposal that also is a Senate proposal, um, at least the amount on line 1296 is uh, from Senator Mann's Senate file 2152. Um, the overall amount for that is 33 point, uh, point five million dollars in the first biennium and 30.3 million in the second. On line 1299 is the governor's um, proposal relating to uh, reporting requirements for prescription drugs of $1.5 million in the first biennium and 1.2 in the second. Line 1303 is a governor's proposal and also a Senator Morrison bill, Senate file 668, uh, relating to additional funding for family planning special projects. The Senate's position is 17. Point, uh, well, 17 million dollars in the first biennium and in the second. <coughs> Line 1308 on the next page. We're on page 33 with only 10 to go. Um, this is MDH money for federal funds oversight of $530,000 per year ongoing. Line 1312 is the uh, governor's proposal for the Health Equity Advisory and Leadership Council, $65,000 per year ongoing. Line 1316 is um, not the governor, it is the governor's proposal. The Senate funds it at a reduced amount. Um, the Healthy Beginnings, Healthy Families Grant Program of $12.9 million in the first biennium and 13 in the second. Line 1321 is MDH funding to uh, continue operating the, the Help Me Connect uh, program. It's $1.4 million in the first biennium and 1.8 in the second. Line 1325 is additional funding for home visiting. The Senate picks up $10 million per year ongoing. Um, line 1330 is uh, the governor's homeless mortality study of $283,000 in the first biennium and 104 in the second. Line 1339 is the governor's proposal for uh, grants for lead remediation in schools and child care centers of $500,000 per year ongoing. On the next page, page 34, is the, on page, uh, I'm sorry, line 1349 is the governor's uh, operating adjustment for the Department of Health. It is spread over three funds, which you can see on lines 1350 to 1352. The total for all funds is $29 million in the first biennium and 33.7 in the second. On line 1360 is the governor's Minnesota One Health Antibiotic um, Stewardship Collaborative, $624,000, how about $312,000 per year ongoing. On line 1364 is um, the governor's proposal for enforcement of the Federal No Surprises Act and to um, conduct a provider directory feasibility study 
The total for that is $2.3 million in the first biennium and one point seven in the second. Uh, line 1368 would establish an Office of Ameri African American Health at the Department of Health. It's $3.7 million in the first biennium and 3.6 in the second, and the Senate's uh, proposal is not the full amount of the governor's proposal. That's true also on line uh, 1373 for the Office of American Indian uh, Health within the Department of Health. It's $3.5 million in both biennia. Line 1378 is uh, the governor's proposed public health system transformation. The Senate picks up $22.6 million both biennia. Uh, line on the next page, we're on page 35 now. Line 1388 is the governor's proposal for uh, grants to expand the health care workforce. Um, the Senate has a slightly different amount than the governor, and also on line 1394 is um, a portion of Senate file 1561. It is loan forgiveness for, um, for nurses. Senate file 1561 is Senate, I'm sorry, Senator Murphy's um, Keeping Nurses at the Bedside Act. The amount for the loan forgiveness is $2.5 million each year of the total. Um, and the total for the entire program is $27.6 million in the first biennium and 28.4 in the second. Line 1399 is a governor's proposal. Um, relating to school-based health clinics, and the Senate picks that up for $3.4 million in the first biennium and $6 million in the second. On line 1409 is the governor's proposal, which the Senate has scaled back a little bit, uh, for strengthening public drinking water systems infrastructure. The Senate picks up $11.4 million in the first biennium and 4.7 in the second. Line 1414 is the governor's proposal relating to long COVID survivors um, and monitoring the impact of long COVID. It's $6.3 million in both biennia. Line 1424 is a cancellation and carry forward of an amount that Department of Health currently has. This is related to the telehealth that was adopted during the pandemic um, and included a study that has not been completed yet. This preserves that funding of $1.2 million that would otherwise cancel in fiscal year 2023 and makes it available to the commissioner to complete the study in fiscal year 2024. Line 1428 is the Governor's uh, proposed uh, trauma system fee increase um, and some changes to how the fee is kept track of in the state budget. Um, it nets out to a cost of $874,000 in the first biennium and also in the second. And if you want to see the amount that relates to the fee increase, that is on line 1433 and 1434. Uh, line 1436 is a governor's proposal that relates to um, um, remittances and reporting for vital records, which the Senate includes. Line 1438 is the governor's equitable health care task force, of, and that's $1.5 million in the first biennium. Line 1442 is the governor's proposal to reinstate the Fetal and Infant Mortality Case Review Committee. Um, and that is $1.7 million in the first biennium and $1.9 in the second. Line 1447 <clears throat> is the governor's proposal relating to HIV prevention and health equity programming. Uh, with a one-time cost of $4.5 million in the first biennium. Line 1452 is, um, relates to 
allowing um, a, a lapsed appropriation for an ITA project to carry forward into the next biennium. Line 1458 is um, the governor's proposed clinical medical innovation. I'm sorry, I think that's supposed to be dental. Uh, dental innovation, um, and that's $2.4 million in the first biennium and 2.5 in the second. Uh, line 1463 um, is the governor's proposal to um, to modify the the I guess accounting structure of how where the Merck fund sits in the state's uh, budget. The net effect of that is uh, three hundred thousand dollars per year increase in the general fund. Part of that is tracked in the governor's budget and the revenue department with the Senate is tracking it in health and human services. Um, on the next page, on page 37, this is now moving into the Senate bills. The first one is on line 1467. This is Senator Morrison's bill relating to elevated blood levels of lead. It's $294,000 in the first biennium and one twenty-two dollars in the second. The next one is on line 1471, Senate file 328. Uh, this is the MDH portion of that bill. It's Senator Mann's bill relating to prescription drug price transparency and disclosures. It's $1.1 million in the first biennium and $830,000 in the second. Uh, line 1475 is Senate File 1274, Senator May Quaid's bill for a grant to the Wilder Foundation for the African American Babies Coalition. It is $260,000 per year plus administrative uh, funding. Line 1480 is Senator Wick Wickland's Senate File 1679, as are the next three proposals. Um, this one is one-time funding for the Health Professionals Loan Forgiveness Program of $2 million in fiscal year 2024. The next one on line 1485, also from that same bill, is additional, an additional psychiatry practitioner um, spot for the Primary Care Residency Expansion Grant Program is $400,000 per year. The next one on line 1490 is the Pediatric Primary Care Mental Health Training Grant Program of $1 million per year ongoing. Line 1495 is the Mental Health Cultural Community Continuing Education Grant Program of $500,000 per year ongoing. Line 1500 is Senate File <coughs> 2269 which is Senator Bolden's bill for grants to four services provided to victims of labor trafficking and exploitation. Um, it is $500,000 per year ongoing plus some administrative funding. Online, uh, I'm on page 38 now. Online 1505 is Senator Kupix, 20, Senate file 2353. Um, a community health worker uh, training program for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. It's $449,000 per year ongoing. On line 1509 is Senate File 1799. This is Senator Utke's bill for a grant of the Minnesota Alliance for Volunteer Advancement, and it is $150,000 per year ongoing. I, I'm sorry, one time. Senate file 2145 is Senator Hoffman's bill. This is the uh, ongoing funding for the Palliative Care Council of $44,000 per year. Senate file 1771 um, is Senator Marty's Universal Health Care System Benefit and Cost Analysis, one-time funding of $1.2 million. Line 1522 is Senate file 302, Senator Mann's bill relating to the all-payer claims database. Um, it's $3 million um, in both biennia. 
Line 1526 is Senator Wicklin's um, Senate File 2002. This is the MDH cost relating to the Healthcare Affordability Board um, of $5.8 million in the first biennium and about $6 million in the second. Line 1530 uh, is Senate File 441, Senator Morrison's bill relating to a study um, for the post forms, one time uh, cost of $730,000 uh, in the first biennium. Line 1534 is Senate File 1814, Senator Fate's bill for the Alzheimer's Disease Public Information Program. That's a one time cost mostly in the first biennium of $486,000 with some uh, sort of residual administrative funding in the second biennium of $14,000. Line 1539 is Senate File 27. This is Senator Housechild's grant for an FQHC apprenticeship program. It's $750,000 per year ongoing. Line 1544 on the next page, we're now on page 39, is Senate File 18. This is Senator Champion's bill for a grant to the Emmett Lewis Till Victims Recovery Program. It's a one-time $500,000 cost in fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 2024. On line 1549 is Senate File 2503, Senator Pappas's bill for a one-time grant for a skin lightning products uh, public awareness and education uh, grant program. Of, uh, the cost for that is $204,000 um, in fiscal year 2024. Line uh, 1554 is Senate File 2090, Senator Morrison's bill for um, additional funding for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders prevention grants. It's $528,000 per year ongoing. Line 1559 is Senate File 2674, Senator Rarick's bill relating to the moratorium on green burials and a study. It's a one-time cost of $79,000. The next one is on line 1563, Senate File 2052. This is Workplace Violence Prevention Grants, grants for Healthcare Entities. It was Senator Bolden's bill, and the total of that is a one time cost um, of $4.7 million. On line 1568 is from Senator Dibble's Senate File 1839. This is a, um, additional funding for at the Department of Health for the Safe Harbor for Sexually Exploited Youth Grants of $1 million per year ongoing. And related to that, on line 1572, is additional funding for the regional navigators for the Safe Harbor pro program of $300,000 per year. Madam Chair, that is the end of the Department of Health proposals. Uh, beginning on the next page um, are the various health-related licensing boards. The Senate's position is mostly um, the governor's position, um, for the most part, the governor's position for these boards is uh, to fund their current service levels. There are a few instances of other things, um, like the Board of Behavioral Health having a request for an additional staff member on line 1583, uh, retirement costs for the administrative services unit on 1593, a fee increase at the Board of Marriage and Family Therapy on line 1606. Um, at the Board of Medical Practice, there are a number of things going on there. Um, it's the service to maintaining the service levels, um, additional funding for staff, and transferring the Board of, I'm sorry, the Health Professional Services Program to the Board of Psychology. So on lines 16, 14, and 15, you can see that money is going to a different health licensing board. There is additional staff on for the Board of Nursing. Uh, uh, 
There are some Senate files in the Board of Pharmacy. They are on line 1636 um, is Senator Mann's uh, Senate file 328. That is the prescription drug price transparency and disclosure. Um, the next line is Senate file 2888. That is uh, Senator Wickland's bill with some PM uh, prescription monitoring program modifications. And on line 1638 is Senator Mann's Senate file 868. Um, that is the proposal for the grant for the medication repository program. The Board of Physical Therapy has an additional staff person. Um, Board of Psychology is uh, taking on the uh, Health Professional Services program. <coughs> And then on line 1662 and 1663 is Senator Kupek's, um Senate file 1522 um, that relates to veterinary technician licensing. That actual bill language is in a different bill, but um, the money goes in this bill. Um, that's the end of the health licensing boards on... Uh, the next group are what we call the other agencies. I think the, well, generally the Senate has taken the governor's uh, position on these proposals. On the next page, on page uh, 42, there are two Senate proposals for the EMSRB, which is the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board. They are on line 1675, Senate file 1017, the regional grants, that was Senator, these were both Senator Seaburger's bills, and then Senate file 2829 uh, for the Medical Resource Communication Center grants. Uh, the Ombudsperson for American Indian Families has, uh, in addition to the maintained current service level, has additional funding for staff, um, and uh, Line 1696 is Senate File 705, which matches the governor's uh, recommendation for the Rare Disease Advisory Council. This was Senator Morrison's bill that does um, that collection of uh, funding activities for that uh, council. Um, at Minsher, um, the Senate has... Uh, taken the governor's proposals, and then on line 1710, the Senate has Senate File 2002. This is a miniature portion of the Healthcare Affordability Board. Uh, line 1711 and 1712, or sorry, 11, 12, and 13 are all from Senate File 49. Senator Wickland's bill from yesterday uh, relating to cost sharing reductions in healthcare reform and such. Um, on line 1715 is an amount at the Department of Revenue for the easy enrollment proposal. Uh, line 1720 is uh, man, uh, MMB, Minnesota Management and Budget. On line 1721 is the governor's uh, proposal relating to the new uh, Department of Children, Youth and Families. And on line 1722 is a Senate proposal um, for uh, MMB to do to consult with DHS and MDH on evaluation and outcomes criteria. On the very last page, uh, line 1724 is the governor's proposal for the new Department of Children, Youth, and Families. On line 1728 uh, is the Department of Commerce portion of some Senate files on line 1730 is two, Senate file 2002. The Health Care Affordability Board on line 1731 is, um, uh, oh, the biomarker <laughs> money. That's where it is. <laughs> um, Senate file 17, uh, line 1731 is Senate file 1948. Um, and line 1732 is Senate file 2459. Um, that is coverage requirements for services by pharmacists. 
And then finally on line 2002, mentioned several times before, is the actual Health Care Affordability Board that's established in that bill. And the amount for that is $3.1 million in the first biennium and $3.6 million in the second. That, Madam Chair, is the end of 43 pages. That's amazing, yes. Thank you. I think it took 90 <laughs> minutes. And Yeah, an hour and a half. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Albrecht. I um, want to acknowledge our staff over the past um, couple of weeks, the intensity of work to get to this point of having this spreadsheet and all the language, which we will not walk through. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank um, Mr. Albrecht, um, our Senate Council, Allie hoffman Litchie, and um, Lexi Stengel, and Nolan Hodella, and Leah Mon Monahan, we, we have a whole team to do this work and it's, um, it takes all of these people to make this possible. So I really appreciate all of, all of your assistance with this. Um, members, are there any immediate questions you have about the spreadsheet? Um, you'll probably think of some over the weekend, but um, anything that just you wanna ask Mr. Albrecht today? He probably would like a break, yes. All right, thank you. And next, we'll move to testimony. Um, first, I'd like to have um, some of the boards and departments um, do their presentation. And then um, we're thinking uh, just the, due to the weather that we'll, we'll do our public testifiers that are in person um, so that if there are people who would like to um, leave and head out, um, and then we will do our Zoom testifiers. So first I'd like to call up Jennifer Molenhoff and Jill Phillips, if they are here. Oh, one person, looks like two. Welcome to the committee and um, please state your name for the record and, and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Jennifer Molenhoff. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Marriage and Family Therapy. And I think it's important to tell everybody here that I didn't pay anybody money to be first. I was as <laughs> surprised as... So, um, okay, I, uh, as I said, I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Marriage and Family Therapy. That's one of the 16 state boards overseeing licensure and practice of health professionals in Minnesota. The Board of Marriage and Family Therapy regulates the licensure and practice of licensed marriage and family therapists and associate marriage and family therapists. Real briefly, an LMFT is a mental health professional trained to diagnose and treat mental and emotional disorders and provide therapeutic services to couples, families, and individuals from a systemic perspective. An LMFT will conduct individual therapy and is trained to do so, but will also offer services to couples and families where two or more members of a relational group are present and active participants in the therapy. Not all behavioral health professionals are trained to provide therapy in that manner um, or to family systems. So I'm here today to speak to the board's request for fee increases. Uh, the board is requesting an increase to 10 specific fees, four application fees and six licensure or renewal fees. Under Minnesota law, all of the health boards um, all of their expenditures must be fully funded by fee revenue, which are deposited in a board's special revenue account. So none of the board expenditures impact the state's general fund. Uh, so when board operations, cost of those operations begin to exceed incoming revenues, fee increases are necessary, or the board would have to take action to reduce operational costs. Um, the Board of Marriage and Family Therapy has not increased a fee, not one fee in over 15 years. Um, we experienced a steady and at times significant growth in the number of applicants for licensure in the period 2007 to 2017. So those increased licensees and the fees they generated were sufficient to cover our operational costs. Um, but I'm here today because fixed costs, primarily salary and benefits, rent, and technology-related costs have increased, and our fee revenues are not increasing at a sufficient rate to keep up with that. So over the past two biennium, we've needed um, 
to access monies that have been in our fund balance to cover our operational costs. And absent increased revenues, our fee fund balance would deplete itself in the next two to four years. So I'm here asking for the committee's support in including these fee increase requests in its omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, I don't know, I didn't see Jill Phillips. Is she present? Okay. Thank you. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. And, and um, as Ms. Mullenhoff mentioned, uh, we are having these two boards present because they did have fee increases in their, in their budgets. So we wanted to have a chance to have them um, let us know where those were coming from. So please go ahead and give it Thank you. Me. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. My name is Jill Phillips. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy here to testify in support of Senate File 2995. Um, our board's mission is to preserve and protect the public health, safety, and welfare of Minnesotans by fostering the safe distribution of pharmaceuticals and the provision of quality pharmaceutical care. We fulfill this mission through licensure of pharmacists, regulation of the practice of pharmacy, regulation of the manufacturing and distribution of pharmaceuticals. We inspect facilities, investigate complaints, and issue disciplinary orders for corrective action. Um, thank you for including the Board of Pharmacy's funding requests in the Senate HHS omnibus bill. We, um, as a board, we have also requested an increase in our licensure fees. The board is currently operating at the top of its appropriation. And without a fee increase, we're at an operating <coughs> deficit that will not allow the board to meet its statutory obligations. With this additional funding, we will be able to, in terms of maintaining our service, we'll be able to fill a vacant pharmacist surveyor position, increasing our capacity to conduct inspections and complaint investigations. And the, perhaps the most exciting for us, this increase in appropriations will allow us to migrate away from paper applications and finally step into the 21st century by digitalizing the application process um, utilizing ALUM software which I believe 14 other health licensing boards are currently utilizing. In addition, the increase in spending authority for the prescription monitoring program is also greatly needed as it fills the gap created by a loss in federal funding. This will ensure that providers will continue to have access to the data needed when prescribing or dispensing a controlled substance. And lastly, we appreciate the necessary funding to administer the medication repository program as well as the Prescription Drug Transparency and Disclosure Program. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, your t for coming today to, to explain that. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move to the Commissioner of Health, Commissioner C Brooke Cunningham. Welcome to our committee, and uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wicklid. Brooke Cunningham, Commissioner of Health. Madam Chair, members of the committee, it is so nice to be back with you again today. As your partner in protecting and improving the health of all Minnesotans, I really do appreciate the inclusion of so many sustained investments for public health in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. I greatly appreciate your efforts and want to highlight MDH's priorities in the bill. First, thank you for providing funding to improve our public health infrastructure. As you know, public health historically has been underfunded and ends up being stuck in a cycle of panic and neglect. Your bill includes new investments for local and tribal public health around the state as well as new investments to maintain a strong foundation for emergency response. As the last few years have taught us, public health has never been more critical, and you can't wait for a pandemic 
or other emergency to make those investments. We appreciate the legislature's investments to create a public health system that works for everyone, everywhere. At MDH, we try hard to emphasize the importance of prevention. Unfortunately, in the United States, 80% plus of our healthcare dollar spending treats chronic diseases. Given escalating healthcare costs, the importance of investing in prevention cannot be overstated. Chronic disease, many of them can and should be prevented. In public health, we want to prevent illness and death by going upstream with partners whenever we can. We know that prevention saves money, saves, saves time, and most importantly, prevention saves lives. To address the growing burden that healthcare is placing on our state budget, we must do what we can to keep people healthier for longer. This is, includes doing today what we can to address the health impacts of climate change as well. So very happy to see funding for climate resiliency in the bill. Additionally, I very much appreciate the investments in making sure everyone can achieve their optimal health. We are all troubled by the Minnesota paradox. We're one of the healthiest states to live in for white Minnesotans, but also have some of the worst disparities for indigenous Minnesotans, black Minnesotans, and other Minnesotans of color. Thank you for new tools that will help us address some of these troubling disparities, including the statutory establishment of the HEAL Council or the Health Equity Advisory and Leadership Council and funding to address the ongoing HIV epidemics in the state. Thank you as well for funding to, include, to continue the work of our cultural communications team so that we are better able to provide health information to all communities uh, in their primary language. Thank you for drilling deeper into disparities in the populations most impacted by health inequities by expanding the work of the Office of American Indian Health and through the establishment of a new Office of African American Health. And also, thank you so very much for the Equitable Care Task Force, which I know will help our state advance bolder solutions to health disparities. Deloitte, a highly regarded consulting firm, estimated last year that inequities in the United States health system cost approximately $320 billion today and could eclipse $1 trillion in annual spending by 2040 if left unaddressed. Thank you so much for putting money into this task force so that we can work on that uh, more robustly in this state. We can also only be successful if we have strong partners to help us deliver public health strategies to improve people's lives, families, and their communities. Thank you for the investments in community capacity building that will help us improve our ability to work better together. Important and successful grant programs Community Solutions, the programs to revitalize the healthcare workforce, Healthy Beginnings, Community Health Workers, the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline are just a few of the grant programs that support our key partners to deliver important services to Minnesotans. Thank you for including administrative costs where you have. As you know, we cannot implement these programs or engage in robust, meaningful partnerships without additional staff. We have to both retain our current staff and add new staff to deliver on this very admirable budget, especially when there are grants to oversee. We want to ensure appropriate internal controls for managing all required grant activities. And speaking of maintaining staff, I very much appreciate the inclusion of the operating adjustment for the department to help maintain our current service levels. This funding re represents uh, support of the talented and dedicated people we have, investments in technology, and again, help and oversight um, that we want for fi fiscal stewardship. Thank you, Chair Wicklin, and to this health committee for all of your efforts in creating this bill, and thanks for your investment in prevention and public health in Minnesota. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, next, we have Commissioner Jody Harpstead. Welcome to the committee, and uh, please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wicklin and members. Jody Harpstead, the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services. 
First, I want to thank you for help in moving our unwinding bill off the floor of the Senate this week. Just before coming over, I received formal approval of our mitigation plan from CMS, and we are ready to proceed to recertify 1.5 million Minnesotans for Medicaid coverage. We're grateful for the budget items of this committee focused on strengthening and supporting Minnesota's families and children and deeply grateful to the governor's office and legislative leadership for deciding to invest so much in this space. Historic investments in childcare. Let's get it done this year. See cap to the 75th percentile, rep reprioritizing basic sliding fee and supporting the childcare industry to support the other sectors of the economy. Administrative improvements for child care providers. Once again, the workforce that allows thousands and thousands of Minnesotans to offer their talents in an historic workforce shortage. So many other great supports for families to make Minnesota the best place for all children to grow up. Funding to support Family First Prevention Services Act, Phase 3. Support for child protection, though hoping to see more for Indian children here. MFIP six-month reporting and other budget um, important reforms. Funding to people experiencing homeless to instead experience housing justice. Food security for Minnesota families. Addressing deep poverty by increasing the monthly benefit for general assistance for the first time since 1986 and investing in programs to support people experiencing homelessness. Again, supports that allow thousands and thousands of Minnesotans to contribute to our economy in an historic workforce shortage. And the crown jewel, support to develop the creation of a department of children, youth, and families to combine the efforts of so many state agencies and a focus on our families, our children, and our youth. We're also grateful for the robust investments in health services across Minnesota and your willingness to invest generously to meet those needs in this historic budget year. A robust package of investments to continue building Minnesota's behavioral health infrastructure to make sure this sector is able to meet the growing needs of Minnesotans coming out of the pandemic, including key investments in children's mental health. I want to commend the Star Tribune for its thoughtful and data-driven examination of the behavioral health crisis that will take all of us from federal to state to county to plans to providers to solve together. Investments that, as our medical director, Dr. Chomolo, talks about build equity into the walls of Minnesota's public health programs and ensure children do not have their health care interrupted throughout the year. Funding to support tribal nations, urban Indian, black and brown communities to deliver culturally specific care to those communities. In terms of investment in DHS infrastructure, we also appreciate support for our, um, our overall operating adjustment support for DHS's fraud division to steadily monitor for fraud, abuse, and error, which I believe has kept DHS-funded organizations from perpetrating the sort of fraud we saw last year in Feeding Our Future. We want to keep talking about fully funding IT investments for service delivery transformation to support children and family services, licensing, and health care, because you can't split with new agencies what you don't have licensing resources, and continuous improvement and compliance. But again, thank you so much for your compassion for and commitment to strong, healthy families and giving every Minnesota child and youth the opportunity to thrive, to grow up strong, and to contribute their talents to our communities and our economy. Thank you very much. Thank you Mike, for coming today. Uh, next, I have Libby Callum. Callum, I'm sorry. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Collum, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Libby Collum. I am the acting CEO of Minsure. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Minsure greatly appreciates your inclusion of Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's recommendations to modernize Minsure's core IT platform, create a health insurance easy enrollment program, and to expand expand public awareness for the Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program. Minsure also supports your efforts to lower out-of-pocket costs for Minnesotans who enroll through coverage through the marketplace. We will be happy to continue to provide technical assistance on that proposal as needed. Since Minsure was established in 2013, Minnesotans have used the marketplace to sign up for over 1 million private health insurance plans. 
And we have delivered over $1.9 billion in tax credits to Minnesotans to help lower the cost of their health insurance premiums. Mincher is immensely proud of our service to Minnesotans, and we are grateful that you have included these proposals in your budget to help further improve our ability to serve those who rely on us for comprehensive coverage. The governor's recommendation to modernize Mincher's IT recognizes that upgrading our legacy IT platform is necessary to providing a streamlined and simple application enrollment experience that removes barriers that help Make it, that make it difficult for Minnesotans to access and maintain health insurance. This investment will lead to improved customer experience, increased access to health insurance coverage, efficiencies that will result in operational savings, and allow Minsure to become a more agile and flexible agency for future policy innovation. Establishing an easy enrollment program will connect Minnesotans to coverage through medical assistance, Minnesota care, or a qualified health plan on the individual market. This voluntary program will allow Minnesotans to check a box on their individual income tax form to request information about their health insurance options. Establishing this program will make it easier for Minnesotans to access affordable health coverage by connecting uninsured Minnesotans with a navigator or broker for free enrollment help and ultimately increase the ability for Minnesotans to seek medical care when needed. Finally, expanding public awareness for the Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program will lead to more Minnesotans being connected with affordable insulin. Since the Safety Net Program's launch, over 1,600 Minnesotans have gained access to over $9 million worth of insulin. We know there are more people out there who could benefit from this program. They just need to know about it. Your investment in public awareness will help Minsure reach communities with the highest prevalence of diabetes and help increase access to life-saving insulin. Thank you again for your support for these proposals. We look forward to working with this committee in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. And last, um, in the kind of the board and department section, um, Erica Barnes from the Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and the Health and Human Service Committee members. I'm Erica Barnes, the Executive Director of the Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council. The Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council would like to thank Chair Wickland and this committee for including Senate File 705 in the budget and for the full amount of the gover governor's recommendation which establishes a base operating budget for the Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council. The requested amount was arrived at after carefully considering the compliance requirements and of an executive branch state agency and a thorough review of the council's statutory duties. These duties include, among others, identifying and educating healthcare providers on best practices relating to rare disease research and care, advising, consulting, and cooperating with the Department of Health and other state agencies on policies related to the rare disease community and addressing barriers encountered by patients when seeking access to healthcare. This base budget is critical to our ability to execute on our mission and any reduction in the amount would significantly impact the functioning of the council. We ask as you engage in the conference committee deliberations that you bear in mind the fact that this is a newly established state agency which is just building its infrastructure. The council would also like to urge this committee to include language from Senate File 1029, known as the Network Access Bill, in your omnibus bill as session continues. This bill will allow individuals with rare diseases to seek care from a specialist with expertise in their particular rare disease without an assessing an out-of-network fee. The council believes that this ability to see the appropriate specialist in a timely manner, manner will reduce the long diagnostic journey for the overwhelming number of rare disease patients who face this and reduce ineffective healthcare utilization through visits that frustratingly do not result in a diagnosis and treatments prescribed based on misdiagnosis. Again, thank you for prioritizing funding this council and please consider um, including the network access bill when you go into conference committee. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next we'll move to, yeah, yeah. 
Um, next, we'll move to testimony from members of the public who are in the room. Um, I will go through the list, and if someone has to step out, um, I will go through and call your name again, um, just in case um, you, have, you need to step out of the room. Um, but I would uh, like to request that everybody keep their, their testimony to two minutes or less. Um, if it's something that you can do in less than two minutes, that would be great. We have... Um, uh, like 27 people that are signed up, you know, to be testifying in person, and we have 23 on Zoom. So I would like to keep the testimony moving along. Um, I will call up the first of three, and then if you can come to the table, and then we'll we'll keep um, keep rotating out that way. So first, uh, I have Buck Humphrey. Is he not here? Um, he may have left. Uh, I have Rahul Karan and Rochelle Schultz and Irene, Irene Fernando. If you could come to the table. And Mr. Karan, if you could state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair uh, Wickland. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Senators, members of the committee, uh, my name is Dr. Rahul Karane. Uh, I serve as the President and CEO of the Minnesota Hospital Association. I am a physician um, who has had the privilege of serving patients in Minnesota for the last uh, almost 25 years in the smallest critical access hospital in Starbucks and also one of the largest uh, healthcare systems in Minnesota. I am uh, before you today to express our extremely grave concerns about the staffing mandates in the bill uh, that you have before you and the dangers that they pose to Minnesotans and patients that we all serve together, you in the legislature and we uh, in the healthcare systems. Let me be very clear. If this bill were to pass with the current staffing mandates, hospitals across Minnesota will be forced to close units, leaving an estimated 70,000 Minnesotans, 70,000 patients without access to care. That's a big number. And those are patients that we have been serving that are your constituents as well. This would be a devastating blow to the health and well-being of our communities, especially at a time when hospitals and healthcare systems are already struggling financially and facing a historic shortage of qualified healthcare workers that is growing every single day. Closing units due to the inability to made, meet registered nurse ratios would also impact those other healthcare professionals that I have worked with for the last almost 25 years. Professionals like respiratory therapists, physical therapists, pharmacists, nursing assistants, social workers, and more who would have to be sent home. For two decades, I have seen how Minnesotans trust our hospitals to be their safe havens during life's most fragile moments, 365 days a year, weekends, holidays, day and night. This bill, this part of the bill threatens that particular lifeline, potentially leaving our patients without access to care when they need it the most. We support some sections of the bill, such as funding for violence prevention, loan forgiveness, and mental health services. However, the proposed staffing committees and ratio mandates that would accomplish, uh, that uh, would come from that, would accomplish little more than reducing patients to a number. Reducing our patients to a number on a spreadsheet. This approach fails to acknowledge that patient care is centered around unique needs of each individual, the patients that I've been serving for almost 25 years, and strips our hospital's abilities to respond to the ever-changing needs of every single individual patient. Ensuring the health and well-being of Minnesotans is our mission, our calling, our reason for being. I respectfully beg you and ask you to consider that care would be rationed should this bill pass your committee in its current form. That is not our tradition here in Minnesota, not our culture, and not what we do in our caring professions in hospitals and healthcare systems. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, and, and feel free to, you don't need to stay at the table until the others are finished. Um, the next, we have Rochelle Schultz. Please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Rochelle Schultz, and I am the President and CEO of Winona Health. 
In all my years in healthcare, I've never seen hospitals in such a fragile state, and I am afraid of what one more blow could do to our system of care in Minnesota. There have been two recent Star Tribune editorials that summarize what I want to share with you today. The first one had the headline, Vital Signs Are Poor at Minnesota Hospitals. The editorial summarizes the economic plight that hospitals are currently facing, and it urged legislators to provide increased state funding to hospitals. In my example, my hospital in Winona, we ended our 2022 fiscal year with an operating margin of minus 3%. This is due to the exponentially rising cost for labor, medications, and medical supplies necessary to serve our patients, as well as the inadequate reimbursement we've received from government payers. 2023 will be worse. I want to express my appreciation to the chair and this committee for your bill's inclusion of an updated medical assistance payment rate for the inpatient fee-for-service reimbursement, known as rebasing. While these payments will still be below the actual cost of providing care, this inflationary increase will help make a difference. The second Star Tribune editorial urged legislators to have caution on nurse staffing reforms, and I couldn't agree more. There are simply not enough nurses to hire. We are doing everything we can to retain staff and recruit additional health care workers. We are in a paradigm shift in health care. DEED estimates there are currently 52,000 open health care positions in Minnesota, which includes more than 5,000 open RN positions. They also estimate that within seven years, Minnesota is going to need an additional 43,000 nurses. This is mostly a result of demographics. Fewer age-eligible workers in the market and a rapidly aging population needing care. If this bill's mandated staffing committee establishes a nurse staffing ratio and we can't find enough nurses to hire, this leaves us with the only other option of shutting down units and services. In Winona, like other rural communities, there isn't another hospital nearby. And even if they were, all hospitals share the same challenge of the workforce shortage. Please know we cannot sustain more burdensome restrictions and regulations. We urge you to do as the Star Tribune suggested, have caution on nurse staffing reforms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Fernando. Madam Chair, members, I'm Irene Fernando, you, she, her pronouns, and chair of the Hennepin County Board. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. There is so much in this bill to be excited about, from investments in our child care system to continuous eligibility for medical assistance for children for 42 months. Thank you for your efforts. I'll focus my two minutes on the most important issue facing Hennepin County, ending unsheltered homelessness. Minnesota is facing a homelessness crisis. Hennepin is facing a homelessness crisis. Since the, since the end of the statewide emergency rental assistance program, the number of families entering Hennepin shelter system outpaced the number of families exiting at a rate of two to one. Hennepin has a commitment to shelter all families because no child should be out in the cold. Today, there are more than 250 families and more than 500 children in shelter. This is 300 more children than this time last year. This rising need is already producing an additional funding gap for 2023 shelter operations. Just last week, the Hennepin Board had to approve an unbudgeted $17 million in local funds on top of previous budget to shelter Minnesotan families. I cannot stress enough the urgency of this moment and the need for state partnership to build more housing and support shelter services. We are grateful to Chair Wickland for including a state match to invest in our response to end homelessness in Hennepin County. We've prioritized housing stability for our lowest income residents through locally raised funds and allocating federal relief nearing $100 million, and this model is working. We partner and learn from people with lived experience to ensure our programming is effective and impactful, alongside a network of providers who are as deeply invested as we are. Shelter saves lives and housing is a human right. This funding will save lives and position Minnesotans to live the vibrant lives they deserve. Madam Chair and members, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to call up Natasha Chernyovsky and Greg oh, Banichkakorn and Mike Opat. Hello, Madam Chair, members of the committee. 
Thank you. My name is Natasha Chuniavsky, and I'm the Legislative and Policy Specialist with Citizens Council for Health Freedom. And I'm here today to share some of our concerns that we see within the bill, specifically the many data collection and use provisions that haven't been heard in judiciary yet. We believe that there are some civil rights implications that haven't been fully um, discussed or reviewed. And so we would request that this bill go to judiciary um, pending its passage here. Before I share my concerns, though, I wanted to state that we really appreciate Senator Mann's bill, um, SF-406, being included in here, the right to a pregnant, uh, a support person for a pregnant patient. Our only suggestion would be to expand this right to all patients. We believe that this would better protect expect expectant mo mothers who may have to um, remain in the hospital post-pregnancy um, or for their infants after their, their delivery. Um, regarding our concerns, though, on Article 4, Section 46, there's the creation of a long COVID surveillance program that hasn't had a hearing in judiciary. Last session, this proposal was called a population-based surveillance system. That specific language has been removed. However, the surveillance aspects of the program are still exactly the same. Um, the, it still is a population-based research program that will track and collect data on Minnesotans who will not be given an option to refuse. Trusted providers should not be required to report patient data to the government without patient consent. This program will violate private contracts and constitutional rights, and thus we ask for a no vote on it. We are also concerned with the numerous references to social determinants of health that as of yet have not been defined in Minnesota law. With no definition, it begs the question of what kind of data will be collected on Minnesotans. We believe this term needs to be defined so that Minnesotans are aware of what information is being gathered. Finally, in Article 4, Section 53, the overdose and morbidity section requires systematic collection of data on infants, women, and children from various institutions, and all of that is without patient and parent consent. So for these reasons, like I said, I would um, urge you to, to pass it to judiciary, but also um, we do oppose the bill overall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Opat, please state your name for the record and begin. Yep. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. I'm Mike Opeth, the Chief Business Development and Community Relations Officer at North Memorial Health. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I know the committee has been very busy. I'll keep my remarks brief. I'm here today to communicate North Memorial's opposition to Article 2 of the Keep the Nurses at the Bedside Act. Article 2 contains very prescriptive and onerous provisions concerning staffing and managing nurses' workload. We at North Memorial support other aspects of the bill. I'll leave it to the professional nursing administrators to highlight the negative effects mandated staffing ratios will bring to patient care and capacity. For my part, I want to remind the committee that North Memorial, along with other hospitals, recently completed a long and sometimes consensuous round of bargaining. It went on for months, and there was a very painful strike during the negotiations. This is a copy of the North Memorial M&A contract that recently passed. It was agreed to. It is 120 pages long. It contains exhaustive detail on dozens of pages concerning work hours, rules, and benefits. In addition, there are more than 10 pages devoted exclusively to labor management committees on staffing. Included are a joint staffing committee, unit councils, a staffing advisory committee, a, nurse, a nursing health and safety committee. There is further language detailing committee memberships, scopes of work, staffing evaluation processes, and systems for delivering nursing care. As I mentioned, this contract was bargained and agreed to by both parties. Neither party got everything they wanted, and each had to accept things they did not want. But ultimately, both sides agreed to the language. Article 2, two is a direct assault on the spirit of this contract and of collective bargaining. We ask that you remove Article 2 language from the omnibus bill. Please do not legislate conflict and thus raise a real question as to whether future collective bargaining sessions and agreements will be subject to legislative veto. Now, more than ever, it is time for all parties to work together to increase the number of nurses at the bedside and not the number of nurses sitting in committees. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have um, Claire Sanford, Peter Wojtuk, and Natalie Casper. Good afternoon. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Claire Sanford, and I am here on behalf of the Minnesota Child Care Association. And I am pleased to be here in support of so many provisions in this bill 
to see childcare assistance rates at the federally recommended 75th percentile is to end Minnesota's 20 years in the wilderness on that issue. It will mean extraordinary things for eligible families and providers, more choice and more access. Permanently reprioritizing the basic sliding fee waiting list, not as good as forecasting, but this plus the additional basic sliding fee investment goes a long way to serving eligible families faster. We currently have over 3,000 families on the wait list in Minnesota for child care assistance. In addition, changing the family definition within child care assistance to allow foster families and guardians will help countless families of the kinds I've worked with over the years. Thank you also for the child care workforce proposals <coughs> included here. The development of a cost estimation model and early educator wage scale help move our profession beyond the realm of an afterthought, both as a public good and as a career path, and follow recommendations of the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force. The inclusion of child care retention payments is an immediate and innovative step, truly nation leading. I think Minnesota is the only state doing something like this right now or proposing it. We are thrilled that the amount in the spreadsheet for these retention payments is much closer to the governor's proposal. We hope in conference it can get even closer. Compensation is the number one challenge in our workforce. I visited a single center with one of your Senate member colleagues last week that could serve an additional 50 children tomorrow if only it could pay the educators. We know we can't go backwards on compensation, and by providing direct grants to the full universe of child care providers, this piece also follows a Great Start Task Force recommendation and finds a way to support educator compensation without passing those costs on to families via tuition, which is already unaffordable for so many. We're also thrilled to see the new Department of Children, Youth, and Families included, a major step towards streamlining and more intentionally focusing on efforts across the birth to five system. One thing we don't see here are other administrative steps from the Great Start Act of 2023, which seeks to further implement transformational recommendations from the task force. We hope that throughout our remaining time this session, we can continue to work together on laying the groundwork for a Great Start scholarship program, over time moving to the task force recommendation of no family paying more than 7% of their income for childcare, merging licensing and parent aware, and additional IT investments to support all of that work. Thank you all, and especially um, thank you well, thank you, members, and thank you to the staff for this incredible piece of work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitehawk. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the record, Peter Whitehawk with Hunger Solutions Minnesota. Um, I'll be very brief, but I just wanted to thank the committee for addressing the needs of hunger in this bill, specifically for including additional funding for tribal food sovereignty, for an increase in base funding to the Minnesota Food Shelf Program, and this funding comes really at a vital time for many food shelves across the state where visits have increased significantly in this last year, causing strain for many food shelves to try and keep up with the demand. And this investment in the emergency food system will make an immediate and long-term impact to those food shelves across the state to ensure they're able to keep their shelves stocked despite rising food costs and transport and deliver food to those who need it, including the growing number of seniors who depend on their local food shelves. And as you work through the conference committee process, we'd also ask that you consider the governor's request to include one-time capital funding to improve and expand emergency food distribution facilities. This would ensure that food shelves are set up with the appropriate storage, equipment, and infrastructure to meet the growing demand. But again, this is a great investment to address food insecurity here in Minnesota. And on behalf of the over 300 food shelves across the state, we thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Casper, please state your name for the record and begin. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Natalie Casper. I am not here representing an organization with a self-seeking agenda. I am not here to make profit or gain money from the government. I am here as a parent, and that is the most important and only qualification I need in opposing school-based health center in family planning grants in Senate File 2995. As a parent, I strongly oppose school-based health centers. This is a very dangerous addition to the bill that oversteps a government's authority and infringes on parental rights. This bill would allow for a huge variety of health services without limitations or age restrictions to take place on the premises of a school or in a specific location in the school district without parental consent or knowledge. To be very clear, this allows for vulnerable elementary and secondary students to be medically seen without parental consent or knowledge in school. A very few concerning healthcare options available through this bill include, but are not limited to, vaccinations on children, abortion services, gender affirming care, including and not limited to, extremely harmful irreversible drugs, experimental social and mental health services, contraception, and prescription administration, 
all of these services done without parental knowledge or consent. The language of this bill would allow sponsoring organizations to be able to collect health data on our children without parental consent or knowledge, as well as giving organizations like Planned Parenthood access to our children. These organizations only stand to profit from my child and a school-based health center. They do not have the best interests of my children at heart. Rather, their interest is making money off of them. At a time when children in Minnesota are failing at reading, math, and science, we should be prioritizing school as a place to learn the basics. School is never meant to be a medical facility, a counseling center, or a professional therapist's office. And additionally, I pose the, I additionally, I pose the family planning grants. This bill in the current format is clearly not about helping adults plan their future families. Rather, it's about targeting young children starting in elementary school and teaching about sexual and reproductive health. This bill is about the legislators in the state of Minnesota wanting to strip parental rights away when it comes to their child's health care and the kind of education they receive. I strongly urge you to oppose these sections of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, um, we have Ann Rogers, Laura Arnold, and Ursula Claren. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Ann Rogers and I am the Chief Executive Officer for People's Center Clinics and Services located in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. People's Center is one of the state's 17 federally qualified health centers and we operate clinics in two locations in Minneapolis. We serve about 8,000 patients, mostly on Medicaid. 86% of our patients are on Medicaid and we serve most of our patients from East Africa. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your work on Senate File 2995. Many of the provisions in this bill benefit communities served by a clinic like ours, including continuous eligibility for children, expanding the adult dental benefit for children or for adults, establishing community health worker development grants, and investing in school-based clinics. There's a letter in your packet from the Minnesota Association for Community Health Centers that um, will provide additional information for you. Today, I want to focus my comments on Article 4, Section 51 of the bill. This section supports vital apprenticeship program for dental and medical assistance. Thank you for including this investment in, the, um, in your bill for the FQHC Apprentice Program. As you know, our state association, the Minnesota Association for Community Health Centers, created a small apprentice program in 2022 for medical assistance and dental assistance. The 12-month training program allows apprentices to work full-time in our clinic while earning a living wage and includes medical and dental benefits. Um, uh, as well as other benefits. Once they graduate from this program, they become fully employed in their new role as a medical or dental assistant. The program has had significant impact on our clinic and the members of our community. They play a critical role in providing needed care. Their roles allow our highly skilled and trained medical and dental providers to provide the needed care. Last year, in the, um, the first year of the apprentice program, People's Center had one medical assistant apprentice. Mario, um, while in his training, used his new skills to save the life of a six-year-old newly diagnosed diabetic patient by acting swiftly and getting the, the child to the hospital before going into a diabetic coma. This year, we have one apprentice uh, for medical assistance and two dental to support the much needed dental care in our recently renovated clinic for both medical and dental, along with a new dental clinic that provides additional expanded access. Ms. Rogers, if you can, if you can wrap up, complete your thoughts. So Thank you. one of the wonderful things about this program is that it recruits apprentices um, from uh, the community, and it is one of the, the, the really important pieces that, um, in this uh, bill. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Um, next, um, Laura Arnold. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Laura Arnold. Um, thank you for hearing my testimony. I have been a practicing nurse um, with pediatrics for over 15 years um, at one entity. Um, I've worked at various units in that entity, and as far as my patients and my job, I love it. It is 
a big priority to me. However, um, recently, especially the last few years, um, there have been two overriding themes in our hospitals. Patients being admitted have increasingly complex care needs, while at the same time, executives tout the values of lean management practices and especially, are essentially expecting nurses and caregivers to do more with less. Many of um, the people testifying that you will hear today against Article 2 of this of um, the keeping the nurses at the bedside bill are not people that provide direct care at the bedside. They are not the ones responsible for enacting the doctor's orders. So it's important for you to listen to bedside nurses saying, we are taking on too much um, to keep it straight. There are complex skill sets that we are required to master um, and be proficient at in order to provide safe, effective care. And if we are balancing heavy assignments and we're telling you we're overwhelmed, we are not able to be mentally present in the moment to provide that safe care. I work on um, a floor with patients having complex physical and behavioral health needs, some exhibiting physical aggression. Again, we need the appropriate number of bodies in order to respond to that in a safe and um, non-traumatizing manner for all. We have had staff of varying um, levels, um, including our support staff and nurses sent to um, emergency rooms from being injured um, with that population because we haven't had the correct resources. Um, and it's the nurse's responsibility to determine whether they can provide safe, competent care when accepting an assignment. When nurses are pressured to accept more than they can handle safely and lack adequate resources or time to complete their tasks and meet expectations, it's only a matter of time before someone, something goes wrong and someone gets hurt. Um, it's been can, said, um, as we've testified at other hearings, you, you know, that we're hopeless. That. We're here because we're hopeful. We're asking you to put action behind the gratitude you've shown nurses verbally. Please um, pass uh, Senate file um, SF 1561. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Ms. Claren, please state your name for the record and begin. Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Ursula Claren, and I'm a labor and delivery nurse. I am a charge nurse and chair of the Birth Equity Work Group. Um, at the Mother Baby Center at Abbott Northwestern Hospital in South Minneapolis, <clears throat> in the heart of um, birth uh, BIPOC communities. Sorry. <clears throat> While working in labor delivery for the nearly eight years, like many of my coworkers, I've acquired a skill of uh, skill sets and years of experience. It's also important to note that obstetric and newborn health care are facing incredible disparities in this country, and evidence-based research shows that proper staffing can help reduce these disparities and reduce nursing burnout. Babies are born at any time of the day and sometimes can be very stressful and chaotic in the high-risk unit as mine. We care for the complex, most complex and critical mothers and their babies. As a charge nurse, I'm a leader of our nursing staff, coordinate emergencies, match nursing skill level to patient acuity, but changes that occur, can occur with little to no warning. In a matter of seconds, I need to be able to support my staff in their, in their care for their patients. Taking nursing, nurses out of staffing decisions increases patient risk significantly. We continue, continually, assess, continually assess patient pregnant patients during their labor or hospitalization for complications. It takes years to hone these skills. Many of us experienced nurses are denied vacation hours because of these skill sets, yet our voices asking to be included in safe staffing committees are denied. Every unit and facility is different and requires different care models and protocols. This cannot be a one-size-fits-all approach, which is why we need to be at the bedside and be a foundation in safe staffing committees. Increasing the load onto work nurses' backs on top of the pandemic, caring for our families and fighting to heal our communities will break every single one of us. Please help us care for our patients safely by giving us a voice and safe, safe, safe staffing in our hospitals. Please pass this bill with the safe staffing provisions from keeping, ner keeping nurses at the bedside act included. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, next, um, Josh Downham and Carrie Oldfield Tabert and Karen Miller. <coughs> Thank you. 
Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee members, Josh Downham. I'm with Serve Minnesota. Uh, Serve Minnesota is the state's AmeriCorps commission, and I'm just going to touch briefly on two provisions. Uh, the first uh, is in Article 4, Section 20. It relates to um, the department uh, being allowed to provide a grant to Public Health Corps. Public Health Corps places trained AmeriCorps members in our local public health agencies to help expand capacity. And through a partnership with the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, we're also creating uh, career ladders for them to get into the careers in public health. So appreciate the inclusion of that in the bill. Um, one provision we hope to get in uh, is a, a governor's provision related to Heading Home Corps. Heading Home Corps is, uh, puts AmeriCorps members in uh, homeless shelters, schools, and nonprofits, and works with families who are experiencing housing instability and homelessness. Um, I was recently in uh, Senator Bolden's uh, neighborhood and met with uh, the Rochester schools where they have three Heading Home Corps members. Um, <laughs> This funding uh, for Heading Home Corps would allow us to continue to provide that service to our schools uh, without cost to the sites. Um, it also leverages the federal AmeriCorps funding to bring that into Minnesota. Um, the one, <coughs> one very brief story, the uh, Heading Home Corps member was working with a family on a Friday. It was late and cold, and they were gonna be sleeping in their car all weekend. Uh, she found food and gas cards for that family to be warm throughout that weekend. That gas cards are not a solution to homelessness, but that Heading Home Court member provided what that family needed in that moment. And I'm hopeful we can continue to do that uh, across the state, and I appreciate uh, your consideration in conference committee. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Ms. Oldfield Tabard. Please state your name for the record and begin. Chair Wicklin and members of the committee, I am Carrie Oldfield-Tabbert and I am the Executive Director for the Local Public Health Association. LPJ represents local public health departments across all 87 counties as well as cities and tribes. Uh, thank you for the inclusion of numerous provisions in this bill that will help local public health best serve their communities and prevent adverse health outcomes. Um, we particularly appreciate the inclusion of grants of $21.4 million per biennium for local and tribal public health departments for public health system transformation. Um, a recent assessment of local health departments revealed how widely public health capacity varies across the state. We know there are gaps in health departments in areas such as the ability to interpret and communicate health data, improve access to health services, and address environmental health threats. While it's challenging to estimate the cost needed to fully fund Minnesota's public health system, national estimates indicate that there is a $32 per person gap between what local health departments spend now and what they would need to fully to spend to fully meet uh, public health responsibilities. In Minnesota, this translates to a gap of $180 million. Um, we hope you will consider further expanding the investment in our public health system to help fill this gap. All health departments need to have a foundation of uh, capacities in place, ensuring they are always ready to serve their communities and achieve equitable health outcomes. Finally, I'd like to thank you for including several other prevention-focused programs in the bill, including support for the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program um, and support for family home visiting services, along with other numerous prevention-focused fo services. So thank you for your continued support of local public health and prevention services. Thank you. Um, Ms. Miller? Yes, hi. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Karen Miller, and I come before you today as a teacher and a mother of six who's passionate about the well-being of all children in Minnesota to raise concern regarding the school-based health centers, which SF 2995 will establish on pages 178 to 180 in the A2 amendment. First of all, let's remind ourselves of the purpose of school. It's education. Schools are to educate children's minds, not to medically treat their bodies. Medical care does not belong in public schools. For the sake of our children who are falling behind, only academic initiatives should be prioritized and funded in our schools. Secondly, these school-based health centers pose a real danger to children. Through them, a child's developmental health will be managed in state-funded schools by state-funded grants, divorced from the loving support and consent of the child's parents. This is a gross overreach of the Supreme Court's parental rights doctrine, which has long upheld the fundamental right of parents to direct the upbringing, education, and care of their children. Through these centers, children will be given medications, immunizations, and receive counseling. 
thanks to the newly passed HF1, SF1, and HF146, they will also have access to contraception, the morning after pill, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and possibly even abortion, sterilization, and gender surgeries, all without parental knowledge or consent. A child could even face immediate removal from his home if a parent does not agree with these treatments. Hopefully you can see how, care, how rather than caring for children, school-based health centers may endanger them. It forms an unholy alliance between the MDH and the MDE, conflagrating the education of children's minds with the medical treatment of their bodies in a way that further drives a wedge of government bureaucracy between parents and children and ushers in nearly complete state control of children's lives. Let's not play politics with the real lives of children in Minnesota and give families one more reason to leave our state. I urge you to remove the school-based health centers from this omnibus bill. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, I have Mitchell Grauberger. Grauberger. I apologize if I got your name wrong. Um, and then Hassan Asadik and Christy Snyder. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin. Hello, Madam Chair and members. My name is Mitchell Grauberger, and I am currently a resident of Columbia Heights. Living through homelessness through no fault of my own multiple times as a teen and young adult has made me passionate about sharing my experiences to make things better for others. Yes, there have been resources for things like food, temporary shelter, etc. Those are not the only costs of living and those resources are limited. I've been forced to take on so much debt to help me survive. I have consistently fallen through and am continuing to navigate cracks in the system. I have been fighting for my life, my entire life. Youth Prize, with the help of other agencies and more importantly, with the direct input of young people such as myself, have developed a plan to pilot a direct cash transfer program in Hennepin and St. Louis counties, including not just money, but wraparound services also being built by youth based on similar programs elsewhere. Through the pilot program and the research alongside it, we hope to prove the efficacy of DCT for the entire state. I am so appreciative of that pilot's inclusion in this revision, and I urge that it continue to be prioritized moving forward, along with other allocated funds that will help Minnesota work towards finding effective ways to end youth homelessness. We must close those cracks in the system for the unhoused youth of today and tomorrow. Thank you all for your time and for your work. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Let's see, Hassan also Hassan. For sure. I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Please state your name for the record and begin. Uh, after, well, it's evening now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, evening, Madam Chair and members of the Senate Committee. My name is Hassan Kais Asadiq. I'm here today to advocate in support of Senate File 1903, right? Well, now it's the omnibus. Oh, well, omnibus bill, um, the Homeless Youth's Cash Stipend Project. I want to provide some truths about the direct impact this program could have on its participants and how, it, how that will benefit the state of Minnesota. I currently receive general basic income from the city of Minneapolis GBI pilot program. I get $500 in monthly direct cash uh, support. So I am a testament of its effective impact. It also provides me the capacity to buffer socioeconomic gaps to show up in this work more informed and present. This is important because I have had the opportunity to use my unique lived experience to serve our state for this pilot program as a youth researcher through Chapin Hall's Policy Research Institute. I'm here today to let our neighbors know that, the, that this direct cash transfer model will work to reduce disparities that make it hard for young people to thrive. As a young person, I've navigated housing insecurity and the negative impact that generations of divestment has had on what opportunities are made accessible for young people in Minnesota. It's important to me that we as a state make a clear commitment to being more culturally responsive. Because up until just three months ago, when I began to work at the same youth service drop-in center that I've received supportive services for several years, I had not experienced financial or housing security. This bill is important to me as it should be for all young professionals seeking to be a part of a thriving ecosystem where transformative experiences occur because we must 
be equally concerned with positive youth development as we are with fiscal responsibility. And in this bill, we realize the opportunity to do both, walk and chew gum. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, Ms. Snyder. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Christy Snyder and I'm the co-lead of the Twin Cities Opportunity Youth Network. Even though I could testi testify about so many things I'm ecstatic about in this omnibus bill, including the Department of Children, Youth and Families, I am so grateful to specifically testify on the inclusion of the Homeless Youth Stipend Project and keep it at its current funding levels. Here are three points that I want to leave you with. One, or first, youth are powerful and we can leverage their energy, ingenuity, and vision to end youth homelessness. We must innovate with young people with lived experience, such as these lovely people, to ensure youth homelessness is brief, rare, and non-reoccurring. By supporting the youth homelessness stipend pilot, you are investing in young people's solutions. Second, we must ensure our innovations are rooted in research that is rigorous and focuses on long-term housing stability. By supporting Youth Homelessness Stipend Project, you are investing and you're leveraging a private investment to participate in the longest research study ever conducted in the U.S. to study youth path pathways out of youth homelessness. We will truly understand what works in Minnesota for our young people and how to more impactfully invest in the future. Third, by investing in direct stipends with optional services, we are avoiding the barriers that keep young people in the social services shuffle. Tax funding for formulas for housing keep young people from attending post-secondary or working full-time. By investing in the youth homelessness stipend pilot, you are allowing young people to launch into adulthood they dreamed of, attending college and working. So thank you. Fight fiercely for this project as you go forth. We will be right behind you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we're going to do a couple of testifiers by Zoom who um, had specific time commitments. Um, first, um, go to Billy Hanlon. And if you can please state your name for the record. Um, oh, okay. Um, let's try um, Diane Halsey. If you can please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. She's not. Okay. And he, you don't see. He's out. He's out. Oh, maybe. Um, just one more try, uh, Billy Hanlon. <laughs> So sorry about that. I'm, uh, I had some computer difficulties. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Senators, members of the committee. My name is Billy Hanlon, Director of Advocacy and Outreach of the Minnesota MECFS Alliance and a person living with MECFS. A high percentage of long COVID patients are meeting the, the diagnostic criteria for MECFS, which is what brings me here today and why I am before you today testifying in support of Governor Wall's long COVID budget proposal. Long COVID is a, but, is a public health crisis that is severely impacting hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans physically, professionally, emotionally, and financially. It is having an enormous impact to the labor force participation rate in our state and is detrimental to the health of our state's economy. It is worth reiterating today that these infectious associated diseases destroy identities, futures, families, and careers. They continue to be vastly underserved, underfunded, under-resourced, understudied, and highly marginalized, leaving a strong feeling of medical abandonment. The Minnesota Department of Health's resources to continue to address this long COVID crisis are inadequate. They continue to be uh, the supporting long COVID survivors and monitoring impact budget proposal by Governor Walls will help MDH bridge some of these inequitable gaps. This proposal will help with funding towards raising awareness, developing consensus guidance, and supporting long COVID survivors and communities. Ongoing funding is necessary to support our understanding of the impacts of long COVID over time as this condition is not going away. We also know that evidence around the causes, prevention, management, and treatment of long COVID and related conditions like MECFS 
will continue to emerge rapidly over the next several years and infrastructure as well as data collection is needed to help disseminate new information and resources as they arise. This funding is crucial for Minnesota's response to the crisis. I implore and sincerely urge you to support this critical proposal and recommendation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. And next, um, Diane Halsey, if you can please state your name for the record and begin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Diane Halsey. I am president and CEO of the Family Partnership in Minneapolis, but I'm also co-chair of the Voices and Choices for Children Coalition. Voices and Choices is a coalition that is focused on improving outcomes for children of color and American Indian children ages zero to eight. And we focus on implementing policies and practices that really meaningfully highlight opportunities um, that exist in the state of Minnesota. But today we are here in full support of Article 13, Section 18 of Sen Senate File 2995, the Community Solutions Grant Program. We're in support of this because we know that this works. It amplifies the innovative solutions that leverage community assets that are culturally relevant and center the experiences and dignity of those most impacted by inequity. We stand with the governor and the full legislature in your efforts to make Minnesota one of the best places to live for all families. Unfortunately, we recognize that for many families of color and American Indians, Minnesota is not a healthy place to live. We are committed to changing that. The Community Solutions Grant Program represents more than just money. It is also a recognition that communities of color and American Indian communities and geographically dispersed communities have invaluable knowledge and must be active and valued participants within the creation of solutions for themselves. For this reason, we are respectfully asking for it, the increase in the dollar amount in the bill to $10 million for the biennium. We piloted this program in 2019, and even though many of the grantees had to implement in the middle of the global pandemic, we are seeing some great results. And we believe this is because communities have the flexibility to design solutions within their own backyards. We strongly encourage you to continue to support the Community Solutions Grant Program at $10 million um, in the way that's outlined in this bill. The collective health and prosperity of our state is ultimately tied to ensuring every child has what they need to survive. Thank you, Chair Wicklin and members of the committee for allowing me to do this testimony. Thank you very much. Um, next um, is Terry Wilder able to um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Terry Wilder. I'm the chair of Any Action Minnesota, a state organization advocating for health equity for people with myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as MECFS, and long COVID. Good evening, Madam Chair and esteemed committee members. It's an honor to speak before you today, but more importantly, it's an honor to speak on behalf of those who cannot be here with us because of the debilitating effects of long COVID. I'm a person living with MECFS, and I know firsthand the devastation of having a virally triggered disease that is underfunded and under-researched. It can shatter your dreams, instill the joy from your life, and I'm determined to prevent others from experiencing this with long COVID. The statistics are alarming. Up to 20% of Minnesotans who contracted COVID-19 are experiencing the disabling effects of long COVID, potentially affecting hundreds of thousands of lives. Children, adolescents, and young adults are not immune to its effects. What's more, studies show that around 50% of those with long COVID meet the clinical criteria for the disease I have, myalgic encephalomyelitis a disabling and complex neurological disease recognized by the World Health Organization. But the impact of long COVID extends far beyond physical health. It disproportionately affects black, indigenous, and other non-white communities, as well as low-income, rural, disabled, and elder populations. The consequences are dire, and we urgently need to understand the impact on these communities so data collection 
is critical and it must be done to provide the specific support and resources to the communities most in need. If we don't have an understanding of who has long COVID and what part of the state needs the help, it will make it difficult to allocate funding to the communities that most need it. Believe me, I know the importance of data collection is nobody collects data on my disease. Federal efforts to addressing long COVID have been sluggish and inadequate, leaving states to fend for themselves. That's why the governor's proposed long COVID funding is so critical. This funding will not only increase awareness of long COVID, but also establish updated statewide guidelines of diagnosis, treatment, and care coordination. It will also provide resources to support those with long COVID, their families, and healthcare providers. We have an ethical obligation to act and take care of our own. We must ensure that this funding is made available to expand the Minnesota Department of Health work on lung COVID and to support community-based organizations that can be funded to provide essential services to those impacted by long COVID. I implore you to support this funding, not only for the sake of Minnesotans, but also as an example for other states to follow. We have an opportunity to make a real difference in the lives of those with long COVID, and it's our duty to do so. So thank you for your attention, and I urge you to support this funding. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next, I'd like to go to, in the room, um, Adam Berry, Joe Selwood, and Dan, oh, excuse me, Julie Shordahl. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Chair Wicklin and members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My name is Adam Berry, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Summit Orthopedics, but I am also here representing Minnesota Ambulatory Surgery Centers, a group of independent uh, physician practices that own and operate surgery centers throughout the state of Minnesota. I'm here today to testify against Article 4, Section 35, Senate File 1681, the section related to notice requirements for transfer of healthcare entities. While we certainly applaud the author's effort in re um, reining in anti-competitive behavior, this bill will have profound negative effects for independent physician practices as well as surgery centers throughout the state. This bill will affect more than just the Sanford Fairview proposed merger due to the excessive burden and power granted to the Attorney General's office. Also, the introduction of lawyers and non-healthcare personnel into medical decisions is concerning. While we certainly welcome safeguards and oversight, we need to have healthcare experts and caregivers involved in these decisions. We do have suggestions for how best to improve the bill, and we appreciate Chair Wicklin's willingness to engage with us uh, throughout this process. Rather than establishing so much new power and authority to the State Attorney General's office in what is an already burdensome process, we would suggest utilizing a notification process through our talented team members at the Minnesota Department of Health, then through interagency communication, having the MDH alert the Attorney General's office for any concerning transactions that would require more rigorous assessment. We think that would be a more judicious use of time and um, process for the uh, the process. Uh, our members and physicians also want to protect patients from monopolies, and we hope that uh, we can work with uh, the necessary uh, parties to make sure that there are appropriate modifications that would be made. Uh, there are additional areas that we have concerns, but we look forward to, to discussing that offline. Thank you again, all the members, for your service and time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Selwyn? Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joe Selwood, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Association for Accessible Medicines, the Trade Association for Generic and Biosimilar Manufacturers. AAM opposes sections 12 through 17 of Article 2. In previous committees, we've told you about the savings that generics provide and the downward pressure they put on drug prices overall. We've told you that they're 91% of drugs dispensed, but only 18% of the total spent. But it really needs to be considered that this is one of multiple pieces of legislation, regulating drug prices, adding uh, reporting requirements and serious financial penalties, and placing new liabilities on the generic drug manufacturers who provide our low-cost drugs. We're opposed because this is not another transparency proposal. 
The transparency requirements are just a mechanism to place punitive price controls on generic manufacturers. But it doesn't stop there. Going far beyond the textbook constitutional violation of seeking to regulate transactions occurring entirely outside the state of Minnesota, it expands the price controls to generic drugs below the reporting threshold, including those with declining prices, and it doesn't even require the drug to be sold or dispensed in Minnesota. Last week, the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security re released a report on the health and national security risks of our current historic drug shortages. Citing the lack of incentives as a significant driver, it states, with few incentives to enter or remain in the market for a narrow but critical set of generic drugs, manufacturers of these products often decide to leave the market and few, if any others, decide to enter. The report concludes these shortage risks carry devastating yet avoidable consequences for all Americans. AAM shares the goal of lowering drug prices, and AAM's members make that a reality. But this legislation will have the opposite effect. Please support low-cost generic drugs and remove these harmful provisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Ms. Shardall. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Julie Shardall. I'm the CEO of St. David's Center, which is a Twin Cities-based nonprofit organization offering a range of mental health services and other therapies to over 4,000 children and families. I'm here to thank you for your support and inclusion in the omnibus bill, the stated priority of Aspire Minnesota and the Mental Health Legislative Network. Senate File 926, which will begin to address the Medicaid rates for mental health services. I'm speaking on behalf of the mental health provider community across our state, which is serving Minnesota's most at-risk children and families. Our organizations are literally the safety net for those who have experienced deep end trauma and have been rejected by other settings that don't have services in place to help them. We offer a continuum of interventions from outpatient clinics to intensive day treatment to residential treatment centers. We offer services that can prevent children from being hospitalized and or where they go after hospitalization to work through what brought them into crisis. These are children who have experienced more trauma and struggle in their young lives than many of us will face in a lifetime at a time when their brains are literally forming. Our goal is to offer healing and corrective experiences in a transformational time of their lives, preventing terrible long-term outcomes. Yet we're doing this work when we're seeing a crisis level in both need and acuity. Need in numbers and need in acuity. I wish you could hear the desperate calls that come into our intake line from parents, grandparents, foster parents that are, are perplexed and needing hope that someone can help their children. We do this work under a broken payment structure of, Medi of the Medicaid system, which has gone without a rate increase for 10 years. While we're competing for staff with private practice clinics that are not seeing Medicaid populations, we simply must provide access to high quality mental health care to children and families with the highest need. And yet we are buckling under a rate structure that has not kept pace with provide the costs of providing services. We can't retain the high quality staff that need, we need to do this work if we cannot pay adequately. So I thank you today for including um, an increase in the Medicaid rate um, for these high quality services so that they are accessible to our community's children and families who need them most. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next, uh, Chelsea Olson and Carrie Mortrude and uh, Nicole Mills. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Chelsea Olson with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans, the trade association representing the non-profit -health, health plans in Minnesota. That's Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Minnesota, Health Partners, Medica, Sanford Health Plan, and UCARE. First, we want to thank you for including several provisions in this bill. Uh, we support the inclusion of the continuous MA eligibility for children. This will help reduce churn and ensure children have consistent access to care. We also support expanding the adult dental MA benefit and the rebasing of dental rates to help ensure greater access to dental care for Minnesotans. 
We would also like to thank you for the inclusion of the MA reimbursement rate increase for doulas, which will help expand access to doula care, which is proven to improve health outcomes for moms and babies. The council also wanted to raise a few areas of concern in the bill. Um, for the managed care opt-out provision in Article 1, we appreciate the language in Section 30 to ensure DHS is educating enrollees on this choice. However, we would request the addition of language to study this change and the impacts it will have on enrollees, and we recommend considering a sunset to ensure the legislature revisits the impact of this change in the future. On the prescription drug carvo included in Article 1, Section 8, we heard testimony in favor of this bill, mentioned the financial needs of small, independent pharmacies. If the goal is to address this issue, then the legislature only needs to raise dispensing fees, which is already included in paragraph B. However, completely carving out the drug benefit from managed care will impact care for everyone. Finally, we request any new benefit mandates included in the bill are effective January 1, 2025. Plans are currently finally finalizing their rates for the 2024 plan year, and the rates will need to be submitted to Commerce for review before the legislation is enacted, which would cause carriers to have to reconfigure their plans in the summer. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Martrud, please begin. Thank you. Testimony. Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Carrie Martrud, and I'm here on behalf of the 22,000 nurses MA represents, which also represents 80% of all acute care nurses in Minnesota. I'm also here as a registered nurse. We commend Chair Wicklin and this committee for the work and commitment to making health care in Minnesota better, and MA members send their gratitude for this bill that will have great impacts across the state. I'm going to speak directly to the provisions of the bill related to keeping nurses at the Bedside Act, which would apply to the entire state so that all patients will have access to safe staffing. As a nurse who left the bedside in one of the largest acute care hospitals here in Minnesota, I cannot express how relieved I am to finally see this issue become a priority. As you know, we have plenty of registered nurses in Minnesota, but not nearly enough willing to work in the unsafe conditions as victims of a system that does not support or protect us when we try to advocate for our patients. It is our duty and responsibility to advocate to the fullest extent possible, yet we risk our employment and professional license to do so. Despite what the opposition has told you, retaliation is real. You heard it from our members, your nurses. This will not turn away 70,000 Minnesotans from access to health care. It will provide a reliable tool for nurses to communicate with hospital leadership so that patients can be cared for with the right number of nurses, right skill level of nurses at the right time. We know very well that hospitals cannot turn patients away, yet storing them in hallways is not health care. The grading system by the Commissioner of Health is the only enforcement when hospitals do not safely staff their units. Why do hospitals not want the public to know what's happening inside their walls? Hospital bedside nurses are in crisis. Research shows that safe staffing levels increase the quality of patient care. Every year we do not address this issue. More nurses leave and another patient is at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, please proceed and state your name for the record. Hello, my name is Nicole Mills. I'm the executive director at Oasis for Youth. At Oasis, we serve young adults ages 16 to 24 experiencing homelessness and housing instability in Bloomington, Richfield, and Edina. Last year, we served a record number of 446 youth. We did this through a drop-in center, our outreach, housing continuum, and our innovative employment program in partnership with the Mall of America, where we are on site every day to help youth get jobs and help youth retain jobs. And youth in your district, Senator Wickland, get to have this service because of the Homeless Youth Act and because of so many supporters in our community. This past month, I've been working on our RFP for the Homeless Youth Act, and I am dreaming with my team and our young folks about solutions to end youth homelessness. We are dreaming of creating a hotel emergency shelter hotel voucher program in Bloomington, in our community. We're dreaming about expanding our drop-in hours and we're dreaming about expanding locations, and we could do that with the Homeless Youth Act. And we also believe that our, the number of people that are gonna come use our services are increasing. In Bloomington Public Schools, um, 
This year in Bloomington Public Schools, they've identified 560 young students who are homeless and highly mobile. That is twice the levels of pre-pandemic numbers. And Oasis is not unique. The Homeless Youth Act and Safe Harbors, Safe Harbors legislation is a statewide response. The state needs to make sure that young people in Duluth, Rochester, Wilmer, wherever they might be, can get services in their own backyard. On behalf of the 13,000 estimated young Minnesotans in our state who may, may experience homelessness in any given year, I urge you and thank you to increase the Homeless Youth Act and the Safe Harbors legislation. And I also wanna say Senator Wicklund serving your district and serving our surrounding communities and our young people has truly been one of the greatest honors of my career. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for testifying. Um, and now I have Anna Odegaard and Randy Elise Roth. And then um, I'll ask again, is Greg Benichkakorn? I could be saying that completely wrong. And um, Buck Humphrey, if you're back. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please go ahead and state your name for the record. Thank you. My name is Anna Odegaard. I'm the director of the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. I'd like to thank Chair Wickland and members of the committee for the investments you make in this bill for a healthier Minnesota, and especially for the provisions in this bill that focus on access and affordability of care as critical components for health equity. I'd especially like to thank Senator Bolden, who may have stepped out, who is our chief author, um, for her leadership on the Get Covered Bill, which requires hospitals to screen patients for eligibility for public health care programs and hospital financial assistance prior to taking action to collect medical debt through third-party debt collection, uh, wage garnishment, and other legal action against the patient or denial of care. Yolanda Pearson, who testified in favor of Senator Bolden's bill earlier this session, shared her experience of having a hospital refuse to continue care for her nine-year-old son because of past due bills. She had insurance through her employer, but it included a 60-40 cost-sharing structure, leaving Yolanda with bills that far exceeded her ability to pay. In 2021, Yolanda charged several thousand dollars in medical bills on a credit card to resolve the past due amount on her account so that the hospital would resume providing care for her son. A few months ago, she learned that she would likely have qualified for a significant reduction in the cost of care based on the hospital's financial assistance policy if she'd been aware that it was available. She has since reached out to the hospital about that assistance and has been told that because she put the charges on a credit card, she no longer owes the debt to the hospital and therefore cannot qualify for a reduction in charges, though she is still paying off the bills on her credit card with interest. The Get Covered Bill will help families like Yolanda's avoid the long-term financial burdens of medical debt by establishing uniform steps hospitals must take to ensure that patients are screened for eligibility for public health insurance and financial assistance to reduce the price of care and offered assistance with the application. This is a straightforward approach recognizing the intersection of financial stability with overall health and well-being. Thank you so much, Chair uh, Wickland, Senator Bolden, and the committee for advancing these provisions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Roth. Thank you, Randy Elise Roth, Executive Director of Interfaith Action of Greater St. Paul. Thank you, Chair Wickland, for the opportunity to testify before you again. My focus is Article 12, Section 2, Senator Marty's Bill on Homelessness. It's line 1139 in the budget. Thank you for including funds for providing stability and economic mobility to families and individuals in Ramsey County experiencing homelessness. We are grateful. However, we look forward to working with you to find more resources so we can retain the successes we built during COVID rather than retrench in a time of great community need. Here's one example. Interfaith Action's Project Home, part of the Ramsey County Continuum of Care, is the largest shelter for families with children in Ramsey County. Most of our guests are children. Before COVID, we had 40 beds on church basement floors. In COVID, when the church is closed, 
we relocated to the provincial house, the former convent of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet at St. Kate's. Now each family has a room with a door that locks and we help each family secure housing, jobs, transportation, legal aid, childcare, and more. And the success statistics are stunning from this COVID move. We went from 40 beds to 100 beds. So we now move about 200 families a year from experiencing homelessness to stability and economic mobility. Our average length of stay has decreased from 83 days to 64 days. And at six months in their new housing, 96% of the families say yes, the arrangement's working. However, if line 1139 is not sufficiently funded, Project Home will be diminished or eliminated and will likely lose that family success for those 200 or so families a year, the family success that's so key to the fabric of our community. We support your work to find additional funding for line 1139 to keep Project Home strong in our community, along with the entire Ramsey County continuum of care. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Humphrey. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I appreciate and really thank you for trying to indulge me earlier. We're negotiating on your favorite subject, white bagging. So uh, appreciate uh, getting me in here. Um, my name is Buck Humphrey, and I represent the Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance, which is made up of both retail health system pharmacists and pharmacies, as well as the College of Pharmacy at the University of Minnesota. Unfortunately, as you'd heard before, um, I have some additional bad news to share with the committee today. Just in the past week, six pharmacies have closed their doors. In addition to Kemper Drug, who you already heard from in testimony earlier last week, who, in Elk River, who'd been there for over 100 years and had to close her doors, we now have an additional three Coburns that are closing their doors, as well as two additional this week in greater Minnesota that have had to close their doors. Why? One reason. Pharmacies in Minnesota and across the country are not receiving sustainable reimbursement. They are not not only receiving it at a cost or excuse me at a level that could at least give them a slight amount of profit like any other business in America, they are well below their cost of business and certainly their acquisition costs. If we don't do something about this this year, you will see more and more and more pharmacies close in the state of Minnesota. We have had the most pharmacy closures, and this is by the PCMA, the PBM's own data, in the last five and 10 years by their studies. That is not acceptable and the access to care is being harmed. Madam Chair, we appreciate all that you are trying to do in this bill, with one exception. You and the members of this committee have heard the real and unfortunately dire testimony about the state of pharmacy and specifically the state of reimbursement in Minnesota. While the big three PBMs and their parent companies like our friends down the road at UHC who just reported 55 billion, 55 billion dollars in profit not revenue, profit, and OptumRx, who is at least 55 or more percent of that uh, quarter over quarter, I think they could do it just a slight bit less and maybe we'd have some of our pharmacies being sustainable and that access to care there. I'll stop on my soapbox. Um, we support uh, the expansion of the DHS formulary committee. Um, we also support the ongoing cost of dispensing survey language in your bill. Um, we also support uh, the carve out, as it's been referred to, but basically going to a 100% for the MA drug spend fee for service model. We appreciate and applaud that, and we appreciate, although we need to make some relevant changes to the first portion of that, that would guarantee the fee for service rate. There's language in there that says it would be half. We need to do something on that. Um, it, yep. Uh, the drug repository program provisions are excellent. Please include those. 
And most importantly, or secondly, to uh, our pharmacists is the inclusion of Senator Mann's consensus pharmacy reimbursement for health services language. We appreciate that, Chair Wicklin. This legislation is another necessary critical piece of the pharmacy reimbursement and sustainability pie. Uh, notably missing from the bill is the ability for technicians to continue to do the work that they've done over the last 28 months in terms of the COVID vaccines. Well over half of all vaccinations across the country and in Minnesota are now being done in a pharmacy setting. And most of you have probably, and I certainly have, have had some of my vaccines done by a pharmacy technician, about 40% of those pharmacies. Uh, vaccinations are done by pharmacy technicians. We'll work with you and the committee members on hopefully including that important legislation as the, per the public health emergency declared by the President of the United States goes away on May 11th, and we need to do something before the fall and the real rush on vaccinations. And if you can... Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then uh, Paul Verrett... Welcome. Hello, Chair Wicklin, Vice Chair Mann, committee members. My name is Paul Verrett. I am the Director of Advancement and Community Engagement for Agate Housing and Services. I am here to call attention to the urgent need for emergency shelter capital and funding for the emergency services program. Agate operates two Minneapolis shelters, and we're very close to having the funding to be able to operate a third, a new 54-bed shelter designed in cooperation with people experiencing homelessness. Just this week, people were turned away from our current shelters. Our shelters have been full for a very long time. We and the other Metro Outreach teams are working with more and more people in encampments. We hear from many people that they choose the danger of staying outside partly because they have lost faith in the shelter system. We know that shelter saves lives. Even during the worst of the pandemic, we were able to increase the number of people exiting shelter by 10%. Imagine what we could do with better facilities and 24 seven staffing. Frankly, our staff, Many who have experienced homelessness themselves are done telling people that we are full and we are done hoping that someone survives long enough that they can get to an open bed. In the end, everyone we serve gets to come home to a safe place with a community that welcomes them. I do not want to diminish the hard work behind this bill and the resources it offers to all Minnesotans. Thank you so much for your support but we urgently need increased shelter capital and more emergency services funding. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to go to, back to um, the Zoom testifiers. Um, it, Jamie Tinter. Uh, then I guess I will ask if anyone signed up and hasn't been called on, we've been trying to keep track of names. If, um, please come Sorry, and I missed a few. <laughs> please, please come forward and um, we've been trying to keep track of the, all of the uh, p names coming in, but it's been challenging. So um, please go ahead and if you could I guess, Mr. Lehman, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, minutes. for this opportunity to comment on the DE amendment. My name is Tom Lehman. I'm here this, this evening on behalf of Prairie Care and Newport Health. Prairie Care is Minnesota's largest provider of children's mental health services. It has a hospital and clinic in Senator Hoffman's district, a clinic in Senator Bolden's district and a, that serves six southeastern Minnesota counties and a clinic in Senator Mann's district. They appreciate the investments in mental health that this bill makes that are, that are greatly needed. Prairie Care is unique as it is one of just two for-profit hospitals in Minnesota. Last year, Prairie Care was not able to refinance its debt and it needed a buyer or face closure. Newport Health stepped up and, brought, and bought Prairie Care. It's a national leader and provider of outpatient mental health and CD services for youth and young adults. It already had a presence in Minnesota because of its purchase of several other Minnesota providers that were facing closure. Newport was able to complete 
these purchases of providers keep the services going and keep the employees working. But they tell me that if the financial transaction provisions in Article 4, Section 35 of the bill were law last year, they might have passed on buying Prairie Care and the other Minnesota providers because these requirements create too much uncertainty and risk. That's bad news for Minnesota healthcare, mental health patients. We should be doing everything we can to encourage, not discourage, new investments in mental health. There isn't a stampede of investors coming to Minnesota to invest in expanding our mental health system. Prairie Care has added more psych youth beds in the last 15 years than all other hospitals in the state combined. They are a unique resource. I've had several conversations with Senator Wicklin and Madam Chair. I appreciate your openness and willingness to, to have a conversation. I hope we can reach an agreement that addresses your concerns and, and desire for more um, oversight without harming current and future mental health patients and providers. One option could be to exempt for-profit or psychiatric hospitals licensed today from the bill. This would allow the Attorney General to step in if Columbia HCA or some other giant for-profit national hospital system de decided they wanted to come to Minnesota while protecting Prairie Care and Regency Hospital, the other specialty for-profit hospital in the state. Again, Madam Chair, thank you and members for your consideration and thank you for your good work on this important bill. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Um, and can you please state your name for the record and thank yeah, you. your testimony. My name is Trisha Rishkis. I'm a registered nurse and uh, part of the, represented by the Minnesota Nurses Association. I work at Children's Hospital. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. As union nurses, we fight day and night for safe staffing. We fight for our patients and families, our coworkers, and our profession. We are fighting for all nurses and all patients across the state of Minnesota. Working short staff puts patients at risk, creates moral injury to us, and burnout. We have said over and over again that there, are, there is no shortage of nurses in Minnesota, only a shortage of nurses willing to do more with less. Our working conditions are our patients' healing conditions, just as educators' working conditions are our children's learning conditions. Our patients and our communities deserve better. <laughs> nurses are at the bedside. We do the work. We know our patients. We know their needs, we know what they deserve. Our experience as healthcare workers is vital when it comes to de decision making on staff, on, excuse me, on safe staffing levels in our units. The staffing provisions from the Keeping Nurses at the Bedside Act would create committees where we can work with hospital administration, sharing our experiences at the bedside and the need needs of our patients in order to create safe staffing plans that work for each individual unit. We need tangible and real action to protect nurses and patients to keep nurses at the bedside. Despite what corporate interest groups might tell you, I wanna stress that the nurse licensure compact is not the solution to nurse staffing crisis. It lowers standards for nurses in Minnesota, harms patient care, and undermines our collective bargaining rights, and risks sending Minnesota's surplus of nurses to other states facing real nurse shortages. Stop listening to corporate interests and support your Minnesota nurses to bring actual solutions. We have the opportunity, you have the opportunity to stand with us and our patients and bring nurses back to the bedside. Please keep safe staffing provisions in the omnibus. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Renner, please. Um, uh, your Madam Chair and members, uh, Dave Renner. I'm representing both the Minnesota Medical Association and the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, we represent physicians and physicians in training. First, I want to thank, thank you for the many different provisions in here to improve access to, to health care. And I won't go through all of those, but I will touch on a few uh, priorities for both organizations. Uh, one, thank you very much for including that language uh, trying to address the issues of mid-year formulary changes and the impact that has on patient um, uh, access to their, to their needed drugs. This is an issue that is physicians across the state and patient groups across the state have said we, we greatly need. 
I also appreciate the language to update our all payer claim database and the uh, ensuring that we're getting the right data on, on how we spend health care, specifically looking at primary care services. Uh, thank you also for the recuperative care. You've heard a lot about homelessness tonight. This clearly is a significant social driver of health and uh, patients cannot recover when they don't have a place to recover after hospitalization. So that is a critical program. Uh, also, thank you for continuing the audio only telehealth services. Um, that has been a huge uh, improvement of patient access throughout uh, the state. Uh, and finally, um, thank you for including the language dealing with uh, provider ordered uh, life sustaining treatment, the POLST. Um, this is again another way to make sure that patients get the care that they desire. I do want to also raise the concerns that you've heard from others about the um, potential unintended consequences dealing with language and on uh, transactions. I appreciate the changes the, the author has included in the bill here, and I know she has been open to continued conversations. Uh, we share some of the concerns about over consolidation, but we want to make sure we don't uh, have, uh, again, unintended consequences. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you. Um, please Hello, state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Megan Walsh, uh, a physician and the chief academic officer uh, for Hennepin Healthcare and a member of the Metro Minnesota Council on Graduate Medical Education, the MMC GME. We're a collaboration of the, the major teaching hospitals in the Metro, including Hennepin Healthcare, Health Partners, M Health Fairview, the University of Minnesota, the Minneapolis VA, Alina, and Children's Hospital. Collectively, our members provide over 60% of Minnesota's physician and advanced practice professional training. For nearly 30 years, the Medical Education and Research Costs Program, or MERC, has made all of this possible. The state support for MERC has been vital. It has allowed us to train the workforce needed in Minnesota. These are direct costs that are not covered by federal GME support, including training salaries for primary care and mental health providers, as well as training in clinics throughout greater Minnesota, county jails, and federally qualified health centers. Without this funding, innovation and research and training programs is also at risk. Our teaching hospitals rapidly flexed to new therapies and added capacity during the pandemic. Without Merck funding, this rapid cycle innovation simply is not possible. Thank you to Governor Walls and Chair Wickland for including this initiative in both proposals. This is not a new appropriation, but merely represents restoration of permanent state funds that existed prior to November's budget forecast. We respectfully request that the study group language be amended to allow stakeholders to work with DHS and MDH to seek new options to maximize federal funding for healthcare education and ensure consistent funding for clinical training sites well into the future. Lastly, we are grateful for the new investments in expanding primary care rural training, the International Medical Graduate Program, and mental health grants for healthcare professionals. Because of these, our hospital alone has added over 14 additional primary care physicians, geriatricians, and psychiatrists to our community clinics in places like Fridley, Austin, and Red Wing. The budget proposed by this committee ensures that Minnesota continues to invest in the healthcare workforce of our future. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Abderholden. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota and Co-Chair of the Mental Health Legislative Network. And Ms. Palin and I will split the network um, uh, issues. Um, as you know, we're in the midst of a mental health crisis, and so we appreciate the investments that you've made in this bill to address it. Um, as you know, we can't address the crisis unless we address our workforce, and so um, we appreciate looking at increasing both the number and the diversity of our workforce. Uh, the Mental Health and Substance Use Disorder Education Center, the Mental Health Professional <coughs> Scholarship Grant Program, the training hours outside of hospitals and clinics, mental health training for pediatricians with our child psychiatrists, adding one psychiatry residency slot, and the grants for BIPOC mental health professionals to become supervisors. We also appreciate the funding for the CMIG grants and putting it in statute so that we can address the disparities in our system and move towards equity. On the children's side, we appreciate the funding for the emerging mood disorders and the first episode programs, which we know will have a huge impact on our young people. Um, also appreciate you including um, changing the definition of neglect so we do not include parents whose children are boarding in the emergency room since it's the system that's neglecting them and not the, not the parents. We also appreciate the additional funding for early childhood um, as well. And then um, the continuous eligibility for children under six. Um, so thank you for, again, all these incredible investments, and I tried very hard to be under two minutes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ms. Palin, please begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Jin Lee Palin. I'm with the Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Programs. Um, we represent 35 community-based mental and chemical health agencies across Minnesota. Our mission is to serve all who come to us seeking mental health and SUD services, regardless of their insurance status, their ability to pay, or where they live. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill provisions. Thank you very much for the inclusion of an increase to our outpatient fee-for-service mental health and substance use disorder rates in Medicaid. Fixing our reimbursement system in Medicaid is foundational to solving our mental health crisis, and this investment makes a real difference. We also appreciate your inclusion of the telehealth extension and audio-only provisions out to the year 2025, and the inclusion of recuperative care. Thank you also for supporting our Psychiatric Residential Treatment Facilities, or PRTFs. We appreciate you increasing the adult day treatment rates. Thank you for including funding for our mobile crisis grants and for 988. And thank you for including the funding and um, language around supporting modifying our certified programs to licensure. Um, there were some other of our mental and behavioral health priorities that were not included, and we do hope that there will be opportunities in the future to connect with the committee on these in coming months. Um, these include Minnesota returning to the national CCBHC demonstration, and we are partnering, and DHS is partnering well with us on um, some language and strategy to move this forward. Um, our mental health regulation streamlining policy and changes, we hope there's some opportunity to work with you on that as well and to continue working on rate reforms for our residential and intensive services and mental health. But really to close, just want to say thank you so much for your support to our mental health and our behavioral health system. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Brooke Hendricks and I'm an internal medicine resident physician at Hennepin Healthcare. I want to thank you for including medical assistance coverage for recuperative care services in your omnibus bill. I met a patient last fall who was being treated for an acute heart failure exacerbation. He had been admitted three times in one month for the same condition. My patient was in a time of transition, staying in a homeless shelter while working with a case manager to obtain affordable housing. While at the shelter, he had inconsistent access to restrooms, which made it difficult to take his prescribed diuretic. As a result, his body was unable to get rid of excess fluid. He developed difficulty breathing and was subsequently readmitted to the hospital. Throughout his admission, my patient shared with me his frustrations with the situation, knowing he would likely end up back in the hospital if discharged to the shelter. I also recognized that staying in hospital level care when no longer indicated can have a detrimental impact on the health of our patients. This patient would have benefited greatly from a recuperative care facility where he could resume medications with reliable access to basic resources like a restroom. He could have had the support and assistance he needed to recover fully from his acute illness rather than to be set up for a repeat hospital admission. This story is not uncommon. My colleagues and I see patients in similar circumstances far too often, many of whom are in more challenging situations than the patient I referenced. One in five patients at Hennepin Healthcare are experiencing housing insecurity. We rely on savings in the 340B pharmacy program to provide services aimed at reducing and preventing hospitalization for people who are unhoused, experiencing substance use disorders, and facing food insecurity. Any changes that impact 340B savings put our ability to reinvest savings into these services at risk. Thank you again for your support for recuperative care services and for your time today. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else who I have, we have missed on the list? Otherwise, I'll go back. There's some, um, some people on the Zoom link. So, um, Is Kalia Pringle um, still available on the Zoom? I am, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Chair Wickard, members of the committee. My name is Kulia Pringle. I am on the Steering Committee for Voices and Choices Coalition and the Minnesota State Director with the National Parents Union. The Voices and Choices for Children Coalition strongly supports Article 13, Section 18 of the Senate Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill, Senate File 2995, Community Solutions for Healthy Child Development Grant Program, along with the other equity proposals of the Department of Health. We are asking to keep community solutions at the governor's recommendations of 10 million instead of the 8 million. This historic program focuses on improving measures of well-being for children and color of American Indian in Minnesota, 
prenatal to grade three through a community and equity centered approach across the state. We wanna ensure every black, indigenous and child of color and their families in Minnesota are seen, heard and feel validated. With this opportunity, we can expand language immersions, home visiting, and so many other issues around the social determinants of health. The Community Solutions for Healthy Child Development Grant Program is an important step in making sure all children have a healthy start at life. Communities with solutions have adequate resources to meet under-resourced communities where they are. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this body. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next, um, Dr. Ruby Tam. Okay, um, not seeing her come up on the Zoom. Um, Suzanne Wheeler. Madam Chair and committee members, I'm here in support of Governor Waltz's budget proposal relating to long COVID. My name is Suzanne Wheeler. I'm president of the Minnesota MECFS Alliance. I'm a US Army veteran. I flew Blackhawks for over a decade in the Army, and then I've raised three young women. I currently am in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, and I'm in person living with MECFS. As COVID-19 and its variants continue to affect Minnesotans, long COVID is emerging as a crisis. Many of those with long COVID also received the same diagnosis as me, which is life altering. Some are homebound, bedbound, unable to work or care for their own families. Current resources at the Minnesota Department of Health are in, in, inadequate to address the impact of long COVID, which may have affected up to 20% of all infected Minnesotans, including children and adolescents. Disproportionate impacts have been felt by the black, indigenous, people of color, low income, rural, disabled and elder populations and more data is needed to understand these impacts. The governor's budget proposes funding to raise awareness, develop consensus guidance and support long COVID survivors. I urge you to support this funding as it is critical to Minnesota's response to the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Um, is Suzanne Arntzen? Uh, so Yes, good evening, Thanks. Chair Wicklin and com community members. My name is Suzanne Arntzen, Deputy Director with Scott County Human Services. Today I'm here representing the Association of Minnesota Counties and the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators in the area of child well-being. We appreciate Chair Wicklin's work to ensure that counties are meeting, meaningfully engaged in the de development of the new uh, Department for Children, Youth and Families. We also sincerely appreciate the investments in the Family First and child care, along with additional investments in the child well-being space. I'm here today to talk specifically about the provisions in Senate File 2995 regarding Community Resource Centers. Community Resource Centers, or CRCs, is an umbrella term used to describe a variety of models like family resource centers, hubs, and community schools. Funding for this innovative and community-driven approach to prevention is a key priority for AMC and for MAXA. Restoring this funding to the levels in the governor's budget will help to sustain and expand this work across the state. The promise of this approach has sparked hope, enthusiasm, and energy for counties across the state to do work differently, ultimately reducing the need for families in uh, entering the child protection system and helping to reduce the disparities that exist within the system. With the help of philanthropy, five counties are currently engaged in this work with more counties expressing interest every day. We are hopeful that as you enter conference committee, you will reconsider investing in community resource centers. But let me tell you why. Over the past four years, I've witnessed Scott County community come together, organize around a vision of ending child abuse and neglect. Individuals with lived expertise, community nonprofits and government have partnered together to successfully launch three family resource centers in August of 21. Since that time, we've served thousands of families and hear daily stories of the impact that community resource centers have on their lives. Just last week, we had a young dad come in, newly parenting a child with disabilities. 
He was on the verge of homelessness. He had lacked access to childcare and was contemplating needing to leave his young child home alone so he could maintain his employment. Had that happened, he would have entered the child protection system. But due to the support and community connectedness, the effort the Family Resource Center provides, his needs were met, his child's needs are now met, and they are living, they have secured housing and they have the necessary supports to continue to thrive. The model is steeped in research uh, based on 37 other states that have implemented and showing results that include increased in school readiness, reductions in child protection, and increases in family strengthening and protective factors. In closing, AMC and MAXA, thank you for your critical work and I urge you to consider reinvesting in the Community Resource Center proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sally, and I'm sorry, I, I may mispronounce your last name. Okay. You got it. Madam Chair and members of the committee, Good evening, my name is Sally Trinka and I'm the Executive Director of Breakwater Health Network, a formal network of independent, rural and small urban, federally qualified health centers and migrant health centers in Minnesota. Breakwater Health Centers provide care in rural and frontier counties across the state of Minnesota from Wilmer to Big Fork to Grand Marais to Moorhead with 21 sites in total. I appear tonight to respectfully and earnestly ask that you reconsider supporting SF2699 a one-time $2.5 million total ask uh, to be served through a grant, a grant aimed at financially supporting the targeted search and implementation for a new electronic health record for those health centers. A new system would allow these vital he health records to focus their energy on patient care and not piecemeal solutions to technological challenges. I'd like to share with everyone tonight this quote from Dr. Paul Terrell, Chief Medical Officer at Sawtooth Mountain Clinic, which serves Cook County and the Grand Portage Reservation. As a family medicine physician with over 30 years of experience in one of the most remote rural areas in Minnesota, I strongly support SF2699. Sawtooth Mountain Clinic is the only primary care provider serving all of Cook County and the Grand Portage Reservation. Since 2008, my clinic has been using the same electronic health record. During that time, our technology has not kept pace with patient care needs. For example, the lack of interoperability between our clinic's EHR and that of specialists in large health systems compromises my ability to provide patients the care that they need. EHR challenges are identified by our team as one of the top reasons for provider burnout. Rural family medicine physicians are already overburdened, providing care to patients who are older, sicker, and poorer than those in urban areas. Many physicians are leaving the profession altogether. SF2699 is crucial to retaining skilled physicians and provide efficient, high quality care to some of the most vulnerable people in Minnesota. In conclusion, a new EHR system will allow for these rural health centers to continue to provide outstanding equity-centered patient care and community support services literally across the state of Minnesota. Providing care in rural communities is challenging enough and technology can help serve as a component of an equalizing solution. I humbly request that you move to include SF2699 in the final spending package. Thank you all most kindly for your time and dedication to health across Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Rhonda Otteson. Thank you, Chair Wicklin and members of the committee. I'm Rhonda Otteson, Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. And we are a statewide coalition of people with lived experience in over 70 organizations. I wanna thank you for the many investments in this bill to address homelessness. We need to match the investments in our homeless response system to the need. And I encourage you to fully fund the elements of Senate File 388, the Pathway Home Act into the omnibus bill. First, I wanna lift up the need for 150 million direct cash appropriation to the Department of Human Services to invest in shelter. Minnesota has never made a pool of funds available to fund shelter capital and the severe lack of shelter spaces reflects this. I wanna refer you to the 2023 capital needs assessment in your packet. There are 86 projects across the state with the need of 200 million to enhance and create shelter for 3,500 people, children, adults, youth, survivors of domestic violence, veterans and seniors in our communities. 
Second, ongoing funding for the emergency service program is essential to fund shelter services and operations. We need 40 million in the next biennium and 70 million in the following biennium. This request takes into account creating and enhancing shelter through capital investments and knowing that COVID response dollars are no longer available. To frame just how deeply underfunded ESP is, during the 2021 RFP process, DHS received 78 million in requests compared to the 16.4 million available, funding just 21% of the requests. Both funding for the ESP program and shelter capital have been included in the governor's budget, among other items in Senate File 388. Finally, I want to lift up the two letters that we submitted. First is this, it includes quotes by people with lived experience about the impact that Senate File 388 would ha have, and a sign-on letter from over 80 organizations across the state in support of Senate File 388 funding levels. Both these letters were circulated quickly and sign-ons occurred in less than 24 hours. Thank you so much to, your, to this committee, and we look forward to working with you this session to make the needed investments to address homelessness across Minnesota. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next, I have Dr. Jordan Unison Christie. Or, I'm sorry. Uh, good evening. Pronounce it. It's all good. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Dr. Jordan Unison Chisky, and I'm the executive director of Lifehouse, located in Duluth. First, I just want to extend my appreciation to you all for the work you are doing on behalf of our state. Uh, Lifehouse has been working with homeless youth and homeless and streetwise youth from ages 14 to 24 throughout the Northeast region and beyond for 32 years. Uh, we are the primary access point for homeless young people trying to obtain housing. I appreciate Senator McCune for championing the Homeless Youth Pilot Project and Chair Wickland for ensuring the full amount of funds are included in the omnibus bill. We need the current amount of funds to effectively do this work in St. Louis County and beyond. By, by providing underserved young adults adequate resources to become stably housed and document how this impacts their lives, this research-based pilot project provides an, us an opportunity to witness and be a part of creating a pathway out of homelessness for young people. In our community housing program last year, we served 487 youth, completed 256 needs assessments, and have 182 young people now on the wait list. This pilot project would drastically shift how many young adults are on the housing wait list by assisting them with the resources needed. We provide homeless and struggling youth wraparound supportive services at no cost. We have a mental health and wellness team. We have a licensed teacher to support young adults with their academic credentials. We also employ young people on site to learn job skills and we operate the only drop-in youth center in our area. The youth who are part of this pilot project would have a team of 40 people around them who are engaged in their healing process in order for them to thrive and who they consider their family. These young people are our future generations, our future leaders. And this funding bolsters how we work alongside our young people so they can pursue their dreams. We also know that the 860 young people we served last year, 60% are indigenous, black, or multiracial, and 38% identify as LGBTQ, who are often experiencing additional barriers to accessing services. Again, thank you for your support, Chair Wickland, Senator McCune, and members of the committee for the current funding amount for this pilot project to lift up our homeless and struggling youth. These funds are a critical component to interrupting cycles of housing instability and generations of trauma and poverty amongst our young people in our county and state. Thank you for your time, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Francis Davis. I'm not seeing uh, Francis Davis. Uh, Deb Fitzpatrick. Welcome to the committee. Please proceed. Hey. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chair Wickland. Deb Fitzpatrick, Director of Policy and Research, Children's Defense Fund, Minnesota. Senate File 2995 moves us forward on achieving a shared goal of making Minnesota the best state in the country to be a child and includes many of the priorities expressed by families involved in our partnerships throughout the state. 
Today, we lift up some of the most transformational sections. Article 13, Section 18 includes increased ongoing investments in the Community Solutions for Healthy Child Development Grant Program, allowing us to tap into the many strengths and significant wisdom in our Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color to better address Minnesota's opportunity gaps that are among the worst in the nation. As the process moves forward, we hope these investments can match the governor and House. A new Department of Children, Youth, and Families, also in Article 13, will increase coordination, reducing the time tax and providing improved support for children, families, and those that provide services to them. The unprecedented investments in childcare and early learning in Article 13 and Article 14 make a significant down payment on the great start for all Minnesota children, North Star vision of ensuring affordability for parents, quality for children, and living wages for providers. These include CCAP improvements, retention payments, workforce supports, family, friend, and neighbor grants, IT investments, among others. We suggest leveraging these investments by adding the Great Start scholarship provisions included in Senate File 2229. Finally, the bill turns proven pandemic era, era innovations that better support children and families into long-term change, including reductions in red tape and improved economic stability for the 43,000 children on MFIP continuous MA coverage to age six, a Minnesota care buy-in for undocumented children, and the and exciting innovations like the homeless youth stipend pilot. Thank you for your commitment to children uh, of Minnesota and for your hard work on this bill. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll check again, Francis Davis. Yes. Hi, um, feel my name is Francis. Oh, please go ahead, yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Frances Davis, and I am Assistant Director at Plymouth Academy and a leader with Kids Count on Us. Uh, I've been working in child care since uh, 1997. We know exactly what child care needs to be affordable, accessible, and a high quality for our families and a sustainable career for our teachers. And we know while this uh, budget is not enough, but it is a good start. This budget will help child care providers stay in operation. There is not a shortage of child care slots, but rather a shortage of teachers. We know that kids, we have kids on our waiting list. We have the space, but not the teachers because we can't, uh, don't have the resources to pay what they deserve. My grandson just started a job at Jimmy John's. He's 14 years old and earns $13 an hour. But in the child care industry, we can only afford to pay our teachers aides a little more than that. We can't compete with Target and Walmart that pay even more. I am thrilled that uh, to see that this bill will raise the child care assistance program reimbursement rate to the 75 percentile for all children, which will allow us to increase our teachers pay and maintain a quality environment for our kids. I'm excited to see that this bill includes the retention payments closer to the government's proposal of full funding of a retention payments is necessary with, uh, without it, child care uh, centers across the state will be forced to raise parents' rates, which will result in families being priced out of child care. I am excited to, uh, of about the new creation of a new department of child, youth, and families, which will streamline services for child care providers and families. Minnesota families and children deserve to be prioritized. Child care is expensive to provide, just like K-1 public uh, education is expensive to provide. These are years and the most important ones we uh, need to invest in them. I look forward to seeing a budget pass that uh, starts recognizing child care for the public good that it is and, uh, and put us on a good path to fully funding child care and giving every Minnesota child a great start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, um, Dr. Ruby Tam. Hello. Hi, uh, please go ahead Hi. and proceed. Yes, thank you. I'm Dr. Ruby Tam. I am the founder of uh, MDCFS Clinic Minnesota. And I am also a family doctor for uh, over 10 years. 
since 2016, I have been treating patients with myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. We abbreviated that as MECFS. People with this disease are often dismissed by their doctors and they were told that it is all in their head. They are depressed or they are lazy. Then when COVID pandemic comes, we now have a lot of people suffering from this mysterious long-term effect after catching COVID. They cannot get out of bed. They might be walk and talk like you and I do, but they cannot drive themselves. They cannot take a shower every day because it is too exhausting and, they, and it's like running a marathon for them. COVID is one of the many triggers of MECFS. We still don't know why some people just cannot get over the disease. We don't have a test to confirm if someone has long COVID or MECFS. We doctors are very overwhelmed by these patients because they are very complicated. We have no answer for them or cure for them. Their families and friends are becoming their caretakers because they just cannot shop for food or do laundries. We need funding to help these people, to put food on the table, to hire someone to help them to do chores, to educate doctors how to diagnose the disease and to teach them how to treat them. We need funding to understand what causes MECFS and long COVID so we can find cures to, cures to bring these people back to work. And I need your help, we doctors need your help all the patients and with MECFS and long COVID need your help. I hope that you guys are able to pass the funding that is mentioned in this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, um, Deborah Watts. Good evening, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee. And I know it's been a long day for you, so I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, my name is Deborah Watts, a cousin of Emmett Lewis Till, an impacted family and co-founder of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization founded by legacy family members in the honor and memory of Emmett Lewis Till and his mother, Mamie Till Mobley. We work really hard to preserve the memory and legacy of Emmett along with his mother, and also are working hard on connecting the past to the present and future, building bridges as well, and bringing awareness to Emmett's place in history and his relevance today. We offer scholarships and programs and advocate for other families as well as they try to move through the kind of trauma that we've experienced over the past few years, 68 years to be in fact. So we thank you. We thank you and your committee and thank you for including the Emmett Lewis Till Victims Recovery Program in the provision of the Omnibus Bill 2995. This will provide the resources for those that have experienced trauma and need mental health and wellness support and services. We know that if individuals live without getting this kind of support, that it will not be, and if it's not addressed, it leads to a deterioration of one's quality of life and all of those things that we expressed in the bill. Therefore, the opposite is actually true as well. If a person receives the mental health support, the wellness support, and the trauma services that we've outlined, then they um, can live a life full of positivity and possibility. Please continue to support this provision. Minnesota can lead the nation in helping families and their heirs and community to begin a more empowered and sustainable journey towards healing mentally, physically. And so we thank you for including the Emmett Lewis Till Victims Recovery Program in Senate File 2995. We certainly are not trying to right all of the wrongs of the past or all the historical traumas, but this is a start. And Minnesota can lead the nation in providing this kind of service and be a blueprint for others as well. I'm just proud to be in Minnesota and proud that this committee has heard our voices and are willing to support the Emmett Lewis Till Victims Recovery Program. Thank you very much for your time and be careful and safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, John Cole.
Thank you, Chair Wickland and members of the committee. My name is John Cole, and I'm the Executive Director of CHUM in Duluth, the largest homeless shelter and food shelf north of the Twin Cities. We served over 8,000 persons last year and are supported by over 40 interfaith congregations in this region. I'm here to testify in support of funding priorities to end homelessness, specifically the need for $150 million for shelter capital to create and enhance our shelter space as stated in Senate File 388 and $40 million this biennium and $70 million in the following biennium for the emergency services program. Shum's shelter was built to accommodate 30 beds in 1996. Since then, we have had to contend with increasing demands for shelter beds. We now sleep some 80 persons nightly, yet we are acutely aware of the 100 persons or so who crowd into our drop-in center daily to access the facilities and services that we offer. Like many of the homeless shelters throughout Minnesota, we are operating way beyond capacity, bursting at the seams. We are in St. Louis County, which has one of the highest rates of chronic homelessness in the state. The city of Duluth has only 155 shelter beds, yet we know that there are over 500 unsheltered persons in our community. We know this because we shelter them during this winter season in a warming shelter. They just get a spot on a floor, hardly one star accommodation, but definitely a five star lifesaver because that's what we are literally doing, saving lives. We in Duluth are asking you, the members of this committee, to invest in this life-saving venture. Our homeless response system is busted, overwhelmed, suffering from years of disinvestment, facing increasing shortages of housing and increasing health concerns and needs. The rate of death is three times higher among people experiencing homelessness than the general population. It's a public health crisis. The public health and safety problems caused by chronic unsheltered homelessness cost the taxpayer an average $35,000 per person every year. Shelter saves lives. And we are asking you to join us in investing in our solution that will save us from that use uh, and that level of expenditure on those unsheltered. Our solution is a unique homeless response system called Stepping On Up. Thank you, It provides Mr. a way where that if persons experiencing homelessness uh, can get into housing. We want to encourage you to join us and we ask you to invest in Senate File 388 because we are in need of saving lives and investment in Duluth in the Northern region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Kimberly Johnson. Good evening, Chair and members. My name is Kimberly Johnson, Financial Services Manager in Wright County. I'm testifying today on behalf of AMC, Maxa, and MICA. I'll focus on the income supports and self-sufficiency aspects of the proposed bill. First, I'd like to thank Chair Wickland for including provisions from the governor's budget recommendations to simplify our economic assistance programs in meaningful ways, such as moving to six-month reporting and prospective budgeting. Updating and simplifying these processes has the potential to mitigate crisis for families who may have income in the past and lost a job and instead allows us to calculate benefits on a family's forward-looking situation. These changes also allow county staff to reduce the amount of paperwork and administrative time and move that time to focus on direct work with families to achieve better outcomes. Second, I'd like to thank Senator Wickland for including provisions carried by Senator Abler to pilot programs for counties to provide in-house training and technical assistance programs. You have heard from my colleagues in previous committees that this initiative has the potential to fill current gaps and wait lists for training, alleviate DHS staff training loads, and open up additional collaboration and training opportunities between counties. Third, we would like to thank this committee for its many investments in our mental health and healthcare systems. From investments in continuous medical assistance eligibility for children, to funding for emerging mood first episode psychosis and mobile crisis services to startup and specialized grant programs for psychiatric residential treatment facilities. Counties are grateful for the consideration of our sorely under-resourced mental health continuum of care. 
Finally, I'd like to thank the committee for including a modest $2 million per biennium to cover county costs relative to the work number as proposed in the governor's budget. Many private employers use third-party vendors to provide employment and wage verification for inquiries. Counties rely on timely, accurate information from these vendors to determine eligibility for income-based public assistance programs. While $2 million would not cover all of the county's costs associated with the work number, it would go a long way to sharing the cost between state and local governments, and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, next, Dan Jensen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Dan Jensen. I'm the Associate Director for Olmsted County Family Support and Assistance. I'm testifying today on behalf of AMC, Maxa, Micah, and Olmsted County. Much of my career has been in public health and has included significant systems work, including interoperability, data standardization, developing systems to support marginalized populations. When I recently transitioned to human services, I was very surprised at the current state of technology, the lack of data standards, the significant gaps in functionality. Um, I'm also the, uh, the co-chair for Max's modernization committees. And through that work, we've been able to be just part of significant conversations with DHS around the current gaps, potential future state, how we can serve our residents in a person-centered integrated service model. Minnesota human services systems are just simply not sufficient, reliable, or responsive to cl current clients' needs or our workforce needs. In your role, you're responsible for programs and outcomes. The current systems are failing to support us to deliver you those outcomes. Our workforce finds the old green screens foreign, confusing, frustrating. Skills they gain with us are just simply not transferable as they try to grow their careers and move into other roles. Our clients have the right to reasonably expect systems that are similar to what um, they've grown up using um, and currently using their everyday lives. Instead, they're at the mercy of cumbersome, inflexible, antiquated systems and all the workaround pieces to try and bridge those gaps. This session, we finally have the ability to say enough and to fund these investments to bring our systems into alignment with what our constituents expect and our committee, our communities need. Specifically, counties support the investment proposed in the governor's budget uh, for systems transformation. In addition, as service delivery partners, counties are left to fund system gaps and infrastructure that's required to support the state systems. We respectfully ask you to consider the local administrative time and technology investments that will be needed in order to implement this transformation and the expertise that counties are offering to assist with this transformation. We are specifically asking for administrative investment to address those county implementation expenses. We're also asking for a dedicated fund for counties to co-develop systems that will fill the local needs in ways that complement the state modernization work. We will work with the state in this critically important systems work, but without the dedicated funding, we'll not be able to modernize that last mile where we work directly meeting client needs. Finally, we ask that the legislature supports in law that counties will play an integral role in the co-development of these transformational processes. As your partners in our state-run county-administered human services delivery system, we look forward to working on this proposal to ensure that new investments in health and human services serve all of Minnesotans in the best way possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I have Maggie Hange, and I'm, I, Apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Minnesota Catholic Conference. Yes, thank you. That's right, Maggie Hangy. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Maggie. I'm the policy associate at the Minnesota Catholic Conference, the public policy voice of the Catholic Church in Minnesota. I'm here today to share our hope that you will use this bill to advance real care for vulnerable populations that helps, not harms. Minnesota's Catholic bishops have consistently supported principled health care reform derived from our core values, respect for the dignity of every human person, concern for the poor and vulnerable, and advancing the common good. Like any basic element of life, healthcare is necessary for development, sustains us, and should be accessible and affordable for everyone. Abortion, which takes a human life, is not healthcare, nor are gender treatments that alter bodies of children based on unproven science. Funding abortion and gender treatments with tax dollars compound bad policy by coercing the people of Minnesota into paying for elective procedures that cause irreversible damage. Fortunately and wisely, these provisions are not included in the D Amendment to SF 2995. As this bill moves into conference committee, we urge you to keep these provisions out as they are currently in the House version. 
Doing so allows for more money to be available for real health care, including Minnesota care for the undocumented. We are grateful that you included this vital resource for children in SF49, but we ask that you expand it to adults as well. This is an area in which we have advocated in the past and will continue to do so, so long as the vital program does not open up to fund elective abortions and gender treatments. More globally, we can help ensure that people can take advantage of the first healthcare clinic, the family, and pass earned sick and safe time legislation. To do so, we need to ensure that the first ensure first that the funding is present so that important program does not overly burden our disability and long-term care providers. Doing so supports the healthcare needs of the most vulnerable populations. We have a choice to use limited resources to advance real health care for vulnerable populations or advance idea ideological causes that harm, not health. Please choose wisely and fund real health care needs and keep abortion and gender medicine out of the final omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, John Walsh. Thank you, Chair Wicklin and <clears throat> committee members. My name is John Walsh and I've been a floor nurse at Unity Hospital in Fridley for the last 12 years. I'm currently on day seven of my COVID quarantine, likely from exposure at work. First, I just wanna say that I love my job. I love working with our patients, but there are too many days where nurses cannot provide a safe level of care, a level of care we want for ourselves and our families. The patients I work with often have dementia or other serious diagnoses, and their conditions are becoming more complex. When they are on the floor, they rely on me and my fellow nurses to keep them safe, keep them from falling, get them to the right testing, monitor possible changes in their condition, administer the right medications at the right time, keeping them and their families informed. But too often, our current staffing levels simply don't allow this type of care. Things get missed. Maybe it's an update to the daughter or a late antibiotic. Maybe it's the stuff only God sees, like the incontinent patient who stays in a wet brief for too long or too often worse things like a fall, but it adds up, stress, the nagging feeling at the end of the shift that you didn't do enough. In recent years, too many of my colleagues said it's too much and they left the job. In previous hearings, hospital officials will blame the staffing crisis on nurses like me for working less than full time. I work seven shifts every two weeks. I used to work more, but I simply was burning out. Too many horrible shifts and I could not recover in time before the next. I have now a part-time nursing job that pays me less than my hospital job, but to me and others like me, it's worth it because of the stress levels we work under in the hospital. If we can address the staffing crisis in a meaningful way, nurses will remain and even return to the bedside, and we can do it. Keep Nurses at the Bedside Act is a common sense approach that brings floor nurses and hospital leaders together to ensure that our patients receive the dignified, safe care they receive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, and that is all the testifiers we have uh, remotely. So um, we have reached, I believe, the end of the um, testifying a portion of, the, of our hearing today. I really appreciate everybody's time and um, effort in coming in and, and sharing your opinions and, and sharing your views on the bill. On Monday, we will meet at 830. And that's in our regular room, I believe in our regular room location, and then we will take up the bill um, and do our, our markup of the bill and um, prepare to have it passed to the Finance Committee. So I really appreciate every, everybody's attention today, and um, seeing no other work before us, the committee is adjourned. <laughs>